Council Member Cormack? Here. Vice Mayor Du Bois? Here. Council Member Philseth? Here. Mayor Fine? Council Member Niss? Here. Council Member Ku? Here. Council Member Tanaka? Here. Six present. Okay, so tonight we have two closed session items. I think we may have members of the public who want to speak to one or both of those. So let's take them one at a time. Um, the first one is a conference. We're going to take them in terms of voting, and then we're going to go into closed session for both items. Um, so the first item is conference for the city attorney on uh, Julio Arevalo versus the city of Palo Alto. Um, do we have any public speakers in this item? I will check any members of the public that wish to speak on the closed session regarding Julio Arevalo, please raise your hand. At this time, I have one member. Okay. Go ahead. I'm trying to, my mouse isn't working. Jessica, can you, are you able to let them speak? Fortunately, I think that the host needs to make us co-host. Let me contact Aaron real quick. Okay, maybe that's it. You should be able to do that now, Beth. Rebecca, you need to unmute and then you'll be able to speak for two minutes. Rebecca, try unmuting. There you go. You have two minutes. Thank you. I'm not. Thanks, Beth. I'm not going to speak for two minutes. I'm going to be very brief. Um, I have a little more to say about the second one. But with regard to this settlement, well, as you all know, I am a lawyer and I've had almost 30 years of experience and I have a lot of experience with civil rights. And I'm urging the city council to settle this matter. I think that this is not the type of um, matter that the city should fight. The evidence is extremely compelling. And I um, urge you to discuss settlement and a fair settlement and other consequences, maybe to the, take out the maybe, to the wrongdoers. Thank you very much. I cede my time. Thank you, Rebecca. If, do we have a motion to go into? Um, I have another speaker. Oh, okay, sorry. David Moss, go ahead, you have two minutes. Is this the one to do with uh, Foothills Park? No, not yet. Okay, I'll wait. Okay, thank you. No further speakers. So I move we go into closed session. Second. We have a first and a second. Can I ask a question? So are we finishing on Aravello and then coming back out to the open session? No, we're not. We're going to just vote on this, then we're going to go to the public. And then go public. back to public. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Council Member Cormack? Yes. Um, I will vote yes. Sorry, I'm uh, going to go by the order. I see you guys on the screen. Council Member Niss? Yes. Council Member Ku? Yes. Council Member Philpeth? Yes. Member Tanaka? Yes. Okay. Okay, and then 6 0 with fine absent. Okay, so now we're going to move on to item number 1A. This is a conference with the city attorney over. Gasque versus the city of Palo Alto, which is Foothill Park. Mr. Vice Mayor, if I could add um, one item to the um, reading of the agenda item, please. Sure. So um, since the time the agenda was published, we did remove the case to federal court. Um, so I want to update the name of the case and also uh, there's a new number. So um, we did notice the case as Gasque versus city of Palo Alto. There are multiple plaintiffs in this case. And so some might refer to it as NAACP. 
uh, Gwen Gask, et cetera, versus the city of Palo Alto. And the new case number now is United States District Court, Northern District of California. The case number is 5 colon 20 CV 07251 capital S, capital V, capital K. And we will update the written record on that as well. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Any members of the public, please speak on this item. Any members of the public that wish to speak to the second closed session, please raise your hands or dial star nine on your phone. David Moss, go ahead. David Moss, you may need to unmute from your side. There you go, Hi. you have two minutes. My name is David Moss and I've been in Palo Alto resident since 1977. I and my family have often enjoyed Foothills Park and the other open space preserves through the decades. This jewel must be protected, but must not be tied to zip code. We much prefer the name Foothills Preserve because it truly is a delicate ecosystem worthy of preserving with its peace and quiet, its miles of nature trails, its browsing deer and coyotes and turkeys and bobcats and dozens of bird species and ducks on the lake. But it's also unique in that it is, has some features of an urban park which no mid peninsula open space preserve has. Like picnic tables, real bathrooms, all handicap accessible, canoe rentals and catch and release fishing. But as I, as I said, this jewel must be protected but not by zip code. This antiquated law can easily be struck down and a lot of money, wasted money uh, saved while preserving this delicate ecosystem. The newspapers have already discussed a proposed pilot that includes a reservation system that limits density on busy, busy days and busy seasons. Density is the key, not where you come from. Keep the number of visitors to a manageable number and you will preserve everything that is good about Foothills Preserve. There's already a 1,000 person limit. The reservation system even allows for a tighter limit on busy days. It's a win-win. I will only be voting for candidates who I think will strike down the law limiting access by zip code, not wait for a vote of the people. That opens us up to a propaganda war a la Trump. I am confident that the proposed pilot is the solution. Thank you. Thank you, David. Our next speaker is Jeff Greenfield. Jeff, you may have to, um, there you go. You have two minutes, Jeff. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, I'm the Chair of the Parks and Rec Commission, speaking on my own behalf this evening. Frankly, I do not envy your position faced with deciding how to proceed with the Foothills Park lawsuit. I'm generally in favor of opening Foothills Park, uh, opening access to Foothills Park, but while balancing fundamental environmental preservation and stewardship responsibilities, as well as the staff and park infrastructure concerns. The timing of this nuclear option to immediately force the park wide open is highly unfortunate. While we're in the midst of a financial crisis, staff is frankly overwhelmed. And the last thing we should be discussing is a plan to increase crowds anywhere in our community during a pandemic. I urge you to consider that any agreement must properly balance environmental preservation and stewardship. Our regional community, not just Palo Altans, highly values our natural resources. Wildlife and habitat may be easily impacted by changes in visitation, and these changes can take years and considerable effort and expense to reverse. And this was clearly articulated by the panel of experts that Parks and Rec hosted recently to discuss the futures of Foothills Park. It's our duty to ensure these prized resources are appropriately preserved. So I specifically recommend a couple of actions. Number one, instruct staff to immediately assess the current park capacity limit at Foothills Park. This is a critical component for any long-term management stra strategy. The existing limit of 1,000 visitors has no scientific basis with respect to what the park can handle. It was set decades ago based on max parking capacity and average number of people per car. 100% parking utilization isn't feasible and what percentage is feasible needs to be evaluated. Not only that, using 2020 standards, uh, it's gonna result in a lower max limit 
it's easy to predict this by observing a busy weekend right now. If you visit, visit Foothills Park, you'll often see cars parked all along the road a distance from Baranda Lake, cars and pedestrians sharing the roads in unintended manners, resulting in likely safety issues. And furthermore, the previous park visitations are, number, are not accurate as a, as a longtime ranger told us recently. Uh, number two, separately assess the appropriate park capacity limit factoring in COVID. Separate social distancing, lower parking, lower max limit should be determined. Weekend visitation is more than double during COVID. We know that it's not a good thing. This would have all been reevaluated during a pilot program, but this now becomes urgent. So I, I encourage you to immediately authorize the evaluation of normal and COVID park capacity limits and maintain uh, and, and prioritize the environmental preservation at the park. Thank you, and I'll speak with you later this evening. Thank you, Jeff. Our next speaker is Rebecca Eisenberg. Rebecca, go ahead. Thank you. So first of all, I wanna state that I do know a lot about the 14th Amendment. I have written two articles about the 14th Amendment for the Harvard Law Review and a third for the Yale Journal of Law and Feminism and have been writing and speaking about 14th, 14th Amendment um, protect equal protection under the law for almost 30 years. This is an area of, of expertise of mine. With that said, the lawsuit, um, which is not a fake lawsuit, is a very valid lawsuit and it states extremely viable causes of action under the state and federal constitution. And it is going to win because it should win. Uh, we cannot put fundamental human rights to vote. As I said in the meeting, and I said that you were gonna get a lawsuit when you voted on this, and of course you voted on it and you got a lawsuit. Um, the entire point of the Bill of Rights is to protect the minority against the tyranny of the majority, which means that the entire point of the Bill of Rights is to protect the few against tyranny of the many, which is exactly why rights pursuant to the Bill of Rights cannot be voted on. The park needs to be opened up. Another analysis here is that can the park be protected while uh, without the limitation on zip code, which has a detrimental impact on people of color? And the answer is yes, the park can be equally protected by just limiting the number of people without limiting the race which is a consequence of zip code, even though I'm not calling you racist, I'm saying that this is how our city was set up. And we need to recognize that we live in a legacy of people before us. Finally, I wanna agree with Councilperson Coos, and I'm trying to say this fast, <laughs> Councilperson Coos request for that you speak about this in open session. The only reason to speak about this in closed session is so you can enjoy the attorney client privilege. I urge you, urge you not to fight this lawsuit. You will be spending taxpayer money fighting the lawsuit. And the only reason to talk about this in closed session is if you are fighting the lawsuit. Please, you are going to lose this lawsuit. You're gonna lose this lawsuit. It's gonna look terrible. You're, you're going to embarrass yourself and cause us more shame. Open up the park, set a limitation of number of people and be done with it. It just shouldn't be closed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca. Any other members of the public that wish to speak to this item, please raise your hand or dial star nine. I am going to check with Aram James because he did ask us earlier and told us he wanted to speak. Hello? Aram, do you wanna speak on this item? Yes, and I wanted to speak on the first item, but I wasn't recognized. Well, your hand isn't up. Uh, yeah, on my screen it is. Yeah, on our screen, your hand is not up. Okay, well. Thank says, you. We'll figure it out. Go ahead. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Okay, so can I speak to the first item as well? Go ahead. Sure. Okay, so basically what I wanted to say was that, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to my uh, uh, iPad here for a second so that I have it here. Uh, I apologize. Okay. So basically, uh, when you're in closed session this evening regarding the brutal beating of Julio Arvalo, I suggest you settle the case ASAP. Do you really want this case to go to a jury? The tape itself of the beatdown of Mr. Arvalo is all you really need to know. See your YouTube video uh, in that regard. 
I'm thinking $10 million would be a good faith starting point regarding any settlement. I'm serious, but go ahead, council members who really believe we have no racist beliefs in Palo Alto and that Zach, the Zach Perone case is just an aberration. Go ahead, roll the dice with the taxpayers' money. See what a jury of Mr. Arvalo's peers has to say. The jury might have a very different viewpoint than a predominantly white upper class and wealthy city council. I say, pay attention to your risk assess assessment folks, not your egos. Here's a little language from the front page of the Daily Post regarding this case. This is the language of the attorney for Mr. Arvalo. Attention, future police officers. If you wanna violate constitutional rights, severely beat people within an inch of their lives without legal justification, engage in criminal conduct often on duty and lie in your reports without any substantial or meaningful consequences, PAPD is the place for you. I don't believe that this language was excessive. I do think the language is not snarky at all. It's simply the truth based on a long and vile history of racism and police brutality by the Palo Alto Police Department with rarely any accountability. You can change that tonight by settling this case quickly and not subjecting us to a huge jury verdict. Appreciate your time on this issue. And are you done with the other one also, Aaron? Uh, no, I wanna to speak to that too. Go um, ahead. Okay, so as some of you may be aware, on September 30th, 2020, Governor Newsom signed AB 3121 to establish a first in the nation nine member task force to study and make recommendations on how to best implement reparations for slavery in California. In my discussions with almost all of the candidates for city council, getting anyone to discuss reparations or even saying the R word has been like pulling teeth with the exception of Rebecca Eisenberg. But now with the passage of the Reparations Act, the discussion of uh, reparations and how to best implement them will be a mainstream uh, for all the state and local governments all over California, whether folks want to discuss it or not. All the more reason to settle the Foothill Park suit today and open up the park to our neighbors. Failure to do so will not only continue to make the city of Palo Alto a national embarrassment, the handwriting is on the wall. Play fair or pay out a ma massive legal fees and a large jury verdict. We can't in Palo Alto do what the old school and old boy racists did in other parts of this country. Block the school doors, padlock the pools, and shut the gates, uh, the, the gates of Foothill Park. Councilmember Koo and your colleagues, it's time to do the right thing. Remember, if we voted today about Pal in Palo Alto whether we should close our schools to African Americans, buying the secrecy of their votes, despite the fact that Brown versus the Board of Education is now more than 60, took, was a set of law more than 60 years ago. Just look at the efforts that Palo Alto takes to exclude African Americans today. Just because uh, Council Member Koo, uh, the majority of your constituents feel like they're white and uh, I, I argue that they are white and entitled, uh, wouldn't, and they wouldn't vote to keep the park, they would vote to keep the car, park closed today, doesn't make it right or constitutional. Please do the right thing, open Foothills Park now. Thank you both. Thank you all. Thank you, Aaron. Any other members of the public that wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand. Okay, so can we get a, a motion on this item? Didn't we have one already? It was on the previous one. Well, then move this one as well. Thank Second. You, Thank you. I have my order, so I, I will vote for us. First, I vote yes. Uh, Councilmember Filseth? Yes. Uh, Councilmember Niss? Yes. Councilmember Ku? Yes. Councilmember Tanaka? Yes. And Councilmember Cormack? Yes. Okay, 6 six zero with Councilmember Fine. Um, absent. So we will go into closed session. I think we're scheduled to come back at 6.30, but we'll notify the clerk. We're going to be a little bit longer. Okay. See you guys in closed session.
Yeah, I see a couple of people back. If you're back, you can turn on your camera, please. Okay, it looks like we have a quorum. It's the city clerk there. Yes, I'm back. I'm here. Can we go ahead and resume? Yep. Okay, so uh, apologies to those who are waiting. We had a lengthy discussion on uh, two closed session items. So there's no reportable action. You know, we're going to resume our public council meeting. Um, the next item is agenda changes, additions, and deletions. I don't believe we have any. Um, right, no, no changes from staff, Mr. Vice Mayor. Great. So we'll move on to oral communications. This is where members of the public can speak to items that are not on the agenda. Um, so city clerk, if we could go to the public for oral. Yes, Vice Mayor. Any member of the public that wishes to speak on oral communications, which is Anything not on the current agenda, please raise your hand or dial star nine on your phone and we will call you. Our first speaker is John Kelly. John, go ahead, you have two minutes. Thank you very much. Vice Mayor Du Bois, council members, I'd like to thank you uh, for listening to all the people who spoke to you about ADUs on October 5th. Uh, that was very kind of you to consider everything that we had to say. I'm, I've written you a letter, but just briefly, I'd like to point out something that has arisen in light of your action on October 5th. By unanimously adopting the new ADU ordinance, even though it hasn't yet had its second reading, I think a new question has emerged which deserves your consideration. And that question is whether or not the new ADU ordinance will be made retroactive with regard to the people who um, in reliance on the recently enacted California legislation started building ADUs and or received permits in the first part of 2020. As I believe it's either section six or section seven of the staff report indicated there were tremendous problems with the emergency ordinance as it affects uh, people who built ADUs thinking that they, the, the construction of those ADUs or at least the 800 square feet of those ADUs would not affect their rights to further develop their primary dwellings. And my letter, I suggested a couple different ways in which I think you might be able to address this issue and provide retroactivity for the new ADU ordinance. I have no idea what the correct procedural route is for doing that. I simply urge you in, uh, in the interest of fairness and pursuing a worthy housing related goal that you find a way to make the ordinance, which uh, presumably will take effect upon its second reading, retroactively uh, applied as of January 1, 2020. I think that's the spirit of the state regulation. And I should hope it's also the spirit of the motion that passed on October 5th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Our next speaker is Rob Levitsky. Rob, go ahead. I would like to talk about the tree ordinance and its ability to keep protected oak and redwood trees from being cut down. There's language in the current tree ordinance that is ambiguous and can be misinterpreted. For example, mixing up or conflating existing building footprint with proposed building footprint or building area. The current code allows for removal of a protected tree if it's touching the foundation of an existing building and threatening the foundation of the building, but it can easily be misinterpreted to mean a proposed building footprint and then a developer just has to show they want to put a new building where a protected tree is and the tree loses. I believe both the planning department and the EIR consultant for the Castilea project have misinterpreted code section 8.10.50B in this way. They cite 8.10.50B to justify removal of three large oaks, numbers 102, 140, and 155 in the Castilea Arborist Report. But these three trees are not dead or dying. They're not hazardous. They're not wrecking the foundation or eaves of an existing building. 
and are not crowding out another protected tree. After careful study, Dave Doctor and I can find no ordinance-based justification for removal of these three protected oaks. Dave Doctor was the plan checking arborist from 97 to 2017. I've written to planning asking for clarification as to which subcategory of 81050B they are counting on to remove these three trees, but I've received no response, even as planning plows ahead full steam with ARB, HRB, and PTC meetings seemingly every week trying to get these commissions to support the project. I believe this misinterpretation of the, three or, of the tree ordinance is likely a violation of CEQA as these clearly protected trees were not listed in the biological resources section of the EIR where a search for alternatives for tree removal would have been triggered. Another 10 seconds. Dave Doctor's motto was always to try to design around nature, not cut it down. If ultimately the city council decides that this project can't be reworked to allow the protected trees to live, the council should be on record by agreeing to a statement of overriding considerations. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Our next speaker is Rebecca Eisenberg. Hi, thanks for letting me speak. Rebecca, go ahead. Hi, thank you. First, I want to thank Mr. Levitsky for his extremely cogent and articulate argument, which is correct about the protection of trees. And I want to second all that. I'm going to use this time as short as it may be to talk about quasi judicial hearings. There have been a lot of statements made by some of you and by some candidates in the press about quasi judicial hearings and what it means about people's um, abilities to speak. Since you're so interested in following the rules about quasi-judicial hearings, I want to take this time to explain to you California law about quasi-judicial hearings. First of all, quasi-judicial hearings are supposed to be fact-finding. The only people who have the right to speak at quasi-judicial hearings are those who are directly impacted by, the, by what is being discussed. And in the case of Castilea, as Mr. Levitsky was referencing, that would mean neighbors of Castilea and not people whose kids go to Castilea, but they live in other cities. They are, should not be speaking at these. Um, because whether or not Castilea is an excellent school, we all agree it's an excellent school, is not relevant to whether or not they're following the law. Um, direct, in, additionally, people who have the right to speak because they're directly impacted actually should not be having their time limited. It is a breach of California law to limit their time. And that kind of limitation actually can render decisions invalid, such as the decision that you all made you, um, with regard to the president hotel. Additionally, um, the decision maker must not be biased, which means that anyone in the decision making party must disclose all biases, whether they're real or perceived, because a perceived bias is often con considered an actual bias by California law. Um, additionally, and very importantly, and gosh, I could go on forever, but to keep this short, the, the, the decision-making body, which is you guys are supposed to report at the end, just about done, facts, findings of fact, and conclusions of law. I would be curious to know what those findings of fact and conclusions of law have been with regard to your many quasi-judiciary judiciary hearings. At no place in the California law does it discuss whether or not um, council members are able to speak to the press as that is not the concern. The concern is fairness. Rebecca, your time is up. I'm done, thank you. Our next speaker is Randy Pop. Thank you very much. I'm Randy, here go to, ahead. You have two minutes. Thank you. I'm here to uh, emphasize Mr. Kelly's comments. I very much appreciated the discussion of ADUs at the council meeting just recently, and uh, wanted to really put a, um, a fine point on John's comments about making this retroactive. The state regulation regarding ADUs went into effect on January 1st, 2020. Our urgency ordinance, which was recognizably flawed, uh, has been ad adjusted and has been attempted to be corrected by staff with the most recent changes. And I think it is very important to recognize that any uh, inappropriate or inconsistent language that was enforced previously should be removed 
And we need to allow for residents who have taken the step of processing or building an ADU since that period of time be given the same rights as anyone else. And in particular, I'll point out one of the most serious takings that has occurred is the way the deed restrictions have been written. And it's very important to undo that along with the, uh, the regulations regarding uh, bonus square footage for a statewide exemption ADU. Uh, so just wanted to, to offer that and to support John's comments otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Aram James. Aram, go ahead. Thank you. I hope I can tie this together. I recommend that you look at 1987 movie called Nuts that starred uh, Richard Dreyfuss and Barbara Streisand. Uh, Richard's um, sister, Kathy Dreyfuss, was a public defender during the same time period that I, I practice in Santa Clara County in Compton as a public defender. One of the things that's little known about the public defender's office is that we not only represent people charged with crimes, but folks that are locked up in psychiatric facilities who are residents of the city of, uh, of the Sa Santa Clara County, um, and, and they're requesting a habeas hearing because they've been up, locked up for maybe 72 hours, uh, 14 days, 30 days, et cetera, et cetera. I had the privilege of uh, doing the interviews of, of folks locked up in psychiatric facilities when I was a legal aid. I guess they call those paralegals nowadays. And that would have been back in about the 77, 78 time period. Once I passed the bar, I had the privilege to represent many people locked up in psychiatric facilities against their will. Got to be quite conversant with the diagnostics and statistics manual. Interviewed, uh, cross-examined many psychiatrists, got to know a whole lot of things, uh, psychiatric skill sets so that when I represented criminal clients later, I had that already in my, uh, my toolkit, so to speak. Why do I bring this up? I had a conversation with a, a commissioner from the HRC who said that um, after he, had, he or she invited me to come to speak about a police practices matter that was on the um, uh, agenda for the Human Relations Commission, he was chided later, I only found this out about two years later, by fellow members of the HRC, I don't know their identity at this point, saying, why would you invite Mr. James to come to the HRC to speak at all? He is a crazy man. Um, you know, I wasn't a precipient witness to that. Uh, so, I, but the person that told me that, I find to be reliable and credible. I wonder what you all think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Our next speaker is Mark Weiss. Mark, go ahead, you have two minutes. Good evening, council members. My name is Mark Weiss. I am calling with glad tidings. There's uh, some good news in the national press about Palo Alto, and it has to do with jazz music and uh, race relations. And what it has to do with is that in 1968, which it seems like a while ago, a Palo Alto high school student named Danny Schur produced a jazz concert with one of the most important jazz musicians of that generation, Thelonious Monk, M-O-N-K, T-H-E-L-O-N-I-O-U-S. And uh, this is a famous event. And in the bi biography of Thelonious Monk, it was uh, described by the professor Robin Kelly as a very interesting event because at the time Martin Luther King had been assassinated and there was a little bit like today, a lot of tension between races. And this um, concert brought people together from various backgrounds, from East Palo Alto, from Palo Alto, students, elders, different uh, ethnicities. And it turns out that a janitor at Palo Alto High School had recorded the show. And Mr. Schur, who went on to a career, uh, S-C-H-E-R, uh, went on to a career in the concert world for Bill Graham Presents, he uh, remembered that he had this thing in his closet for, or attic for many, many years. And it was arranged very recently to be released. The local paper, Powell the Weekly, Yoshi Kato had an article, New York Times had an article, NPR. There was a bit of a snafu that it was delayed, but it is now out. You can find it on the internet. You can download it into handheld devices. You can get it on vinyl. 
I actually got a call because I, I, I was a collaborator on some level from a kid from Palo Alto High School writing about this. Anyways, I think we should uh, do more programming, uh, city-sponsored live music, jazz, stuff like that. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Any other members of the public that wish to speak on oral communications, please raise your hand. Vice Mayor Du Bois, there's no other speakers. Great, thank you for the public speakers and uh, it's supposed to be an awesome album. Um, let's move on to minutes. Do we have a motion for minutes? I'm happy to move approval of the minutes of September 28th and October 5th. I'll second that. Uh, let's vote on the minutes. Start with uh, Councilmember Niss. Yes. Councilmember Ku. Yes. Councilmember Tanaka. Yes. Councilmember Cormack. Yes. And myself is a yes, and Councilmember Filsa. Yes. The minutes are approved. Uh, we'll move on to the consent calendar. Any motions for consent? Happy to move approval of the consent calendar, items three through seven. Second. Okay, we have a first and a second. See uh, Council Member Tanaka's hand up. Go ahead, Greg. No on four. Okay, so that's the no on four. Anybody else? All right, so let's vote on the consent calendar, Council Member Ku. Yes. Council Member Tanaka. Yes. Council Member Cormack. Yes. By myself is a yes. Council Member Filseth. Yes. And Council Member Niss. Yes. Okay, so that's <coughs> six, six yes with one no on item number four. Council Member Tanaka, do you want to speak to your no? I do. So um, it's too bad this is not after uh, our next item, item eight which is about the preliminary fiscal year. Um, as we all know, um, it's looking pretty pretty scary. I mean, there's some good, some, some bright spots, but overall pretty scary in terms of how it's looking. And, you know, I, I think rather than looking to cut services, like services for residents, I think it's more important that we look at, like this project here is for serving pipelines. These pipes aren't going anywhere. They're in the ground, they're already there. Um, to me, spending this money now, when we could try to preserve some of the services for our residents, doesn't seem to make sense. Um, I, I, I don't understand the rationale why we have to do it right now. I mean, there's a whole bunch of other cap projects that will come after this, but it just seems like the urgency for this is not there. And so I, I don't think this is the right priority. I think we need to prioritize the spending. And I think we should prioritize spending more on the services for people that are here versus capital projects. Okay, thank you. I think I also got some momentum up and I forgot to ask if there were any uh, public speakers for the consent items. I didn't, I don't see any hands up, but. I don't see any hands up either. Great. Okay, I'm gonna move on to city manager comments. Thank you, Vice Mayor, uh, members of the council. Let's see, we've got some slides up here in the interest of time. We'll make this fairly quick, but I will note, as noted uh, by Mr. Weiss under his comments, uh, I do have the album from Th Th Thelonious Monk. Uh, it's playing in Palo Alto. It is available, not to make a plug, but easy, easily found on Amazon uh, and elsewhere. So it is very cool. A little bit of history uh, right here in Palo Alto. All right, so with that, just a few comments. I've got some help here to drive the slides oops and i'm sorry let me get my display right all right primarily focused on uh, latest developments with respect to local response and and management through the coronavirus and still i'm sorry having some trouble with my screen 
All right. Um, here we are uh, really two weeks into moving into the orange uh, tier. have noted that uh, certainly members of the community at all sectors are working through uh, the new rules. Um, would note that a couple of areas that we've seen particular interest is on the ability to have uh, gatherings, outdoor gatherings of up to 200 people and indoor gatherings uh, limited to 25% of the capacity of the room that they're in or 100 people, whichever is fewer. There are some specific rules around that. The other issue is now the ability of restaurants to uh, allow indoor dining up to 25% of their indoor capacity or 100 people, whichever is fewer. The rules around indoor dining are a little more stringent than outdoor dining. So uh, certainly we know an issue that we've been in conversation with restaurants here in town uh, and that they're working through. So lots of detail behind these uh, rules in the orange uh, tier, but again, in the interest of managing risk, risk for exposure, and uh, certainly we know all parties are, are working with the best interests of the community at heart. Uh, and I would note that we have a, a web page uh, dedicated to this general topic area with lots of links that would be helpful at cityofpaloalto.org slash coronavirus. All right, next up, in terms of some of the, the local issues that we've been working through, Oh, once again, I'm sorry, having trouble with my display. Um, playgrounds opening, and in, in particular, uh, these are uh, neighborhood playgrounds. I uh, do want to note that these are not staffed. And so as a result, we have uh, ensured we've got signage at each of these playgrounds, uh, recognizing distancing requirements, uh, maximum occupancy at the structures and the like. Uh, noting uh, that while uh, we are uh, performing regular cleaning, that because these facilities are not staffed, the, the, uh, there is a responsibility for uh, adults who are there um, with children. And uh, as such, want to ensure that community members are aware uh, that uh, it is everyone's responsibility to ensure that these uh, um, Play structures and playgrounds are used um, with a focus on safety and again, according to the posted signage rules. Next slide, please. And then specifically as it relates to the Magical uh, Bridge Playground, uh, we really appreciate the partnership we've had with Magical Pl Bridge Playground, excuse me, boy, that's a difficult to say three times fast, uh, foundation uh, and are working uh, collaboratively to uh, reopen the facility as soon as we can. Our community services uh, department staff have been working on uh, developing a plan that will allow um, staffing to be redeployed from other facilities in order to get the facility open by mid-November, if not sooner. Again, there are a few steps uh, that need to be covered in order both to handle redeployment as well as working with volunteers uh, to ensure that that's handled uh, with training and safety protocols in place uh, and have that uh, facility open as quickly as possible. Uh, we do have uh, information on this particular topic on our homepage uh, with the uh, uh, button on news. Next slide, please. Then also want to note uh, development since our last uh, council meeting that we do have a specific page, www.upliftlocal.org established uh, to provide op specific opportunities for community members to see uh, promotions as well as information on open businesses throughout the city. And uh, we are uh, working with businesses uh, to allow, provide a platform for promotions that could be available at various steps throughout the months of October, November, December, and into the new year, uh, really to help uh, both uh, community members, residents, as well as uh, businesses in looking at the opportunities and trying to take maximum uh, advantage of uh, our ability to act as a community together in uh, supporting uh, both our uh, community civic life uh, within our business districts, as well as to patronize our local businesses. Next slide, please. We are also uh, 
picking up additional um, means through which community members can give us feedback on this Uplift Local program, including our online uh, feedback. We've uh, established the city's uh, Open Town Hall platform as a way to have residents, businesses, anyone who'd like to provide uh, feedback and comments uh, to the city on an ongoing basis. Uh, we uh, also have the ability through that platform to allow uh, people who leave comments to see comments left by others. So it is a way to, to see what others are saying about our open streets or closed streets, depending on how you look at it on California Avenue and University Avenue, which we know will be coming back to the city council soon to have a discussion of the extension of uh, closed uh, to vehicle traffic. Um, we do have uh, an upcoming public check-in meeting, which will actually be tomorrow, tomorrow evening at 5.30 p.m., which is a new time in order to try to strike a balance and, and make it available for people who may be working during the day, as well as those who are wanting to do something different with their evening, and uh, just have an opportunity to hear the latest in terms of where we are with Uplift Local, as well as, uh, as I just noted, we've got this feedback uh, questionnaire so that it's on demand. People can leave uh, comments with us at any time and we'll be rolling those comments up for the council's information when we bring uh, this uh, topic back for your consideration and further discussion. So the uh, site to look at here is our homepage, cityofpaloalto.org, and then under Share Uplift Local Experience under News. Next slide, please. Then as we turn to more opportunities for community uh, recovery or a sense of uh, enjoyment, dare we say, at, at this uh, challenging time, Halloween is coming up. And as we've talked about it previously, just want to reiterate uh, some key uh, pointers from the county, really been reinforced by the state and others as well. Keep a risk low by staying home or keeping celebrations small with your own household or neighbors really uh, nearby uh, within your uh, block or as the case may be your, your close in circle uh, and uh, limit the moderate risk activities. We do want to uh, draw attention to a few city sponsored programs that are ongoing, including our Jack O'Jaunt uh, that uh, will uh, provide opportunity on the 30th for people to see uh, community made uh, jack-o'-lantern uh, creations, as well as a few other programs that are ongoing at cityofpaloalto.org slash Halloween. We know we've had uh, quite a bit of interest from residents, both uh, for themselves as well as for neighborhoods. So we really wanna provide this uh, one-stop uh, resource uh, for people to get information as Halloween gets closer and those who are procrastinating, really having to figure out what they're doing for Halloween. Next slide, please. Then lots of activity ongoing, including schools uh, now initiating and phasing in in-person uh, classroom activities with the uh, lowest grades, youngest grades uh, first. And just want to note that uh, the city's crossing guards are being deployed uh, and, and being uh, ramped up in recognition of students being on the street. And especially given that numbers are lower than they typically are in terms of number of uh, children that may be uh, walking to and from school to really uh, ask for extra attention from motorists, uh, residents around town, uh, looking for uh, small pedestrians as may be uh, encountered uh, around town. And as such, our uh, crossing guards are out, additional police support with uh, police uh, uh, implementing what they're calling an adopt a school campaign to pay particular attention to traffic around schools uh, over the next several weeks. And also noting that while as a part of your budget, uh, we've reduced the uh, school resource officer uh, position and deployment to schools that uh, the police department via patrol and detectives are picking up on campus issues uh, as needed. And next slide, please. Then uh, maybe just a couple of last points here to a reminder of our regular testing uh, program that is at the Palo Alto Art Center every two weeks, the next opportunity this coming Friday, uh, with uh, really uh, outstanding both uh, uh, productivity by the county staff. I understand last time they were here, we had on the order of 700 tests uh, that were uh, performed 
uh, during that day. So the advanced uh, appointment system, as well as the response from the community has been very strong and we love to see that continue. Next slide, please. And I believe this is the last, uh, just a note and a plug for the board's commissions uh, committee's recruitment, which by its current schedule closes tomorrow. And I understand that we do not currently have sufficient candidates for all of the positions that are open. So really an opportunity for community members that have been thinking about it, but uh, perhaps thinking about when they might want to uh, put their hat in the ring, so to speak, or to step forward uh, and uh, apply for one of these positions that this is an outstanding time. And I believe that's the last slide. I need to check on that. Thank you. With that, uh, back to you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Great, thank you. So we'll move on to our two action items tonight. Uh, the first one is action item number eight. It's a preliminary Q1 uh, fiscal year 2021 uh, financial update with potential direction to staff on budget revisions, staffing revisions, and next steps. Um, does staff have a presentation? Yes, we do. We'd like to do a quick walkthrough on this. And let's see, Ms. Noze, Director Noze, thank you. And turn it to you to get the slides going. Can everyone see it? Yes. Fantastic. So, all right, I think the first slide is Ed. How yep. <laughs> Making me look bad by driving your own slides. Thank you. Well, um, so with that, uh, let me just uh, do a quick overview and then I'll turn it to Kylie to walk through some of the particulars here. Um, first, just really want to hit the, the headline here and uh, really want to say thank you and recognize the work of the City Council in planning uh, for the impacts of COVID-19, uh, what it has had uh, and we are now experiencing in our current fiscal year, the decisions that the Council undertook uh, both through the spring as well as through your budget actions were difficult, very difficult. And uh, quite frankly, uh, those have allowed us to maintain a sense of stability over the past uh, few months uh, that has been extremely important. And uh, quite frankly, I believe um, somewhat um, put, put us in a better position than some of our uh, colleague agencies that have uh, perhaps had to play a bit of catch up. So just wanna note that tonight is a, is a step in an ongoing uh, series of uh, discussions that we'd like to have with you over the next uh, several months uh, and really throughout the year as we um, uh, respond and monitor uh, the ongoing effects of the pandemic and its effect on our financial status. Uh, our uh, adaptations of operations, we believe, have been documented pretty well in our uh, fairly brief, but uh, our attempt to uh, do a write-up for you that's a part of your packet that goes through on a department-by-department -department, uh, basis, just a snapshot on some of the activities and some of the changes in the ways that we're doing uh, the services uh, and providing services to the community in order to reflect the, the adaptation. I think it's fair to say that uh, not unlike, or, or quite frankly, very similar to the private sector, that we are, oops, taking a step back, um, but also uh, taking more time in order to deliver the same or even less uh, quantity of service than was possible prior to the pandemic. And given that uh, we will continue to monitor, um, but do want to be able to report uh, to the council where we stand in terms of services, as well as uh, our, our expenses associated with that. Uh, let's see, with that, uh, we'll get into the particulars and then uh, Kyla will turn it back to me. And I'd like to talk a bit about this uh, topic of the community economic recovery strategy uh, that we'd like to uh, begin the conversation with the council on tonight. So with that, Ms. Nose. Thanks, Ed. Um, and good evening, Council. Um, I'm Kylie Nose, the Administrative Services Director. Um, as Ed mentioned, um, we're really here to go over um, a highlights report on preliminarily on where we're at. Um, so the typical finance person in me will give all kinds of caveats that this is not final Q1 data. 
Um, even the year end numbers are not necessarily final, um, but it is the information we have at this time. Um, we are going through our annual year end financial CAFR um, activities with our outside auditors. Uh, and obviously staff continues to manage and uh, review financial activity um, as it occurs. So we'll do our best. If we have new information, we'll verbally provide updates. Um, and before I also get into it, I just wanna recognize the team of people that are here on Zoom that normally you'd be able to see in council chambers um, to help us go through this report, everything from the financials to the recovery, as well as, as Ed mentioned, the, um, the work that the departments are doing um, in this revised environment. We also have our consultants for sales tax on the line. Um, we have Fran, who is their um, VP of Government Affairs for Muni Services, as well as Thomas, who is our client manager, and they do a deep dive into our sales tax reports uh, for us on a quarterly basis. Um, so with that, we're really here to focus on where we're at, um, and there are four key things that staff laid out uh, to try and obtain updates to council as well as feedback on. Um, the first is we had attrition ramps in the budget um, that were approved for both police and fire departments. Um, police ha and so we'll go through the status of those and where we're at. Um, also rental relief. So the city is both a tenant as well as a landlord. Um, and in those instances where we're a landlord, um, we have nonprofit and for-profit tenants. Um, and as the council has discussed, uh, you know, trying to be supportive of our tenants is uh, something up for um, discussion and hopefully direction um, in terms of maybe some overarching principles or guidelines that the council would like to see in terms of addressing um, rent costs, frankly, for our current tenants. Uh, the next is, I'm sure you all remember, you set aside $744,000 in a COVID council reserve. Um, and this was really set aside because there were many unknowns when we set up the adopted budget back in the springtime. Um, so although staff is not recommending use of this reserve, um, any feedback and um, that the council has in terms of where they would expect or like to see these funds allocated or spent or not spent uh, would be helpful as staff continues to work through the financial analysis. And then lastly, as um, our city manager mentioned, that we're going to go through different areas of recovery, um, areas that are within our control, areas that are outside of our control, macro, micro. Um, and get council's feedback and acceptance of kind of the, the rough outline and next steps in that process. So uh, as I mentioned, this is super preliminary um, and this is based on the information in the various sectors at the time that we were writing this report, which was in September. Um, you know, another piece of this is, this is all uh, pretty much assuming that there isn't a second wave, but we all have talked that and our health experts have said that we may be at risk of a second wave of our um, of the virus. And ultimately that would have significant impacts on um, financial forecasts and estimates. Um, ultimately, as we kind of think about um, the what's happening to our city, both economically and financially, it's all being driven by um, the virus um, one way or another and how it's in control or not, um, and ultimately the, the efforts underway in addressing that public health emergency. Um, so you can see, and if you're looking at consumer sentiments, uh, obviously they've rebounded since the trough essentially in Q2 2020, calendar year 2020, so the fourth quarter of our last fiscal year. Those are right now basically as low as we've seen our statistics um, for things like unemployment, things like uh, consumer confidence, um, inflation, et cetera. Um, and they have rebounded, but they do remain below uh, pre-COVID uh, levels. Uh, UCLA Anderson just put out their um, new forecast in September, and ultimately they're projecting modest, mo I say modest, uh, very minor growth of almost maybe 1.2% uh, in Q4 of this calendar year. But that's predicated on a $1 trillion uh, stimulus bill. So if that stimulus doesn't come through in this Q4, they openly state that that growth is overstated. Um, so a lot of factors at play happening nationally, locally, um, and everything in between that are ultimately impacting. We have no idea how long the recovery period is going to be. Um, many experts are saying 
18 to 36 months um, for some of the, the tax revenues and us kind of moving back to whatever our new normal will be. Um, and ultimately, you know, for us, things that are going to impact us are things like our daytime population and, you know, residents, visitors, Stanford, um, and how they're planning to open or not open and welcome students, faculty, staff, um, businesses, business travel, um, international travel, obviously, is significantly stifled. Um, and then ultimately, even if uh, the virus or uh, shelter in place restrictions loosen, ultimately consumer behavior and confidence in both the stability and safety of resuming, um, I guess, their kind of normal business is going to play a, a factor in this. So for example, yes, restaurants are able to have 25% indoor occupancy, um, but it remains a question whether or not the consumer is going to feel safe um, eating within that indoor space or not. Um, and how ultimately that will feed through from an economic perspective. So COVID-19 response, um, the city for the CARES Act with the state um, has been awarded $855,000. Um, this is typically awarded through Cal OES as 25% matching of FEMA, FEMA's 75% reimbursement. Um, so that's basically something that has been done from a legislative perspective. It is obviously subject to audits. Um, to make sure that the expenses that we used are eligible expenses for that. And staff continues to report on those activities um, to the state as requested. Overall, we've spent probably about $3 million in response. Um, this does include the half a million dollars for business grants, as well as about 200000 just shy, maybe 160000 170000 worth of waived fees. Um, this is for things like the parklets. Overall, in the general fund, um, probably as of maybe mid-September, about $26.5 million were collected and that's about 13.5% of the budget. Um, a little bit low. The 46.9 million that has been expended is about 23% of the budget. So you would think that through the end of September, you would have about a quarter of revenue, a quarter of expense. Obviously there's seasonality to those, um, but you can see that there's a, uh, an imbalance. Um, our BSR, Budget Stabilization Reserve, Right now we're projecting it at 35.9 million. So with the reduced 2021 budget, remember we reduced our expenses down to $197 million, um, is about 18.2% of that. So we're just shy of the 18.5% target level um, of 500, by 575,000. Um, and this all excludes that $744,000 reserve that council set aside. Uh, if I were to try and peg this back to what we had projected at the end of the year last um, June when we did our Q3 budget cleanup, um, this means that the general fund ended about $3 million to the good compared to what we were estimating. Um, so back then we were estimating a draw on the budget stabilization reserve of 11 or $12 million um, and we were off by about 3 million. Public safety attrition. So three fire positions remain at risk for separation from the city by 1231. Um, so this is that attrition ramp. Um, fire had until the end of December uh, to stave off, uh, sorry, um, layoffs uh, with general attrition that are happening um, through the ranks. So still watching that closely, but ultimately we do have um, an area there that potentially has um, risk. Uh, police is complete uh, as of October 31st, which was their um, attrition sunset date. And then lastly, uh, deferred and or delinquent rent. So ultimately we had made a, um, we were trying to help our tenants during the March, April, May, June timeframe when COVID originally hit and we allowed tenants to defer payments for lease revenues. These are tenants such as Coverly um, you know, where we have artists um, and nonprofits, as well as for profits, um, as well as other tenants. And basically, they would be put on a 12 month lease repayment plan starting January of 2021. So, those are the deferrals. And then there are um, areas where there's just delinquent lease revenue. Um, the tenant didn't opt in to uh, this program, but they still hadn't paid their revenues or, or something like that. And so, roughly, that's a little over $500,000. So other funds, um, our workers' compensation costs are rising. 
Um, the fund is solvent and we have the appropriate reserves, uh, but it's just a notable expense as we move through this really tightened time. General liability claims costs are actually trending down, which is great. However, as the council knows, we do have increasing claim costs that are expected. Um, we have some major litigation. Um, there are cases like the current stats case or the city's current green case, as well as a number of others that may have additional costs that are not necessarily programmed or reserved for. Um, so this is an area for us to be mindful. Utility billings. Uh, as expected, uh, similar to the rent side of things, on our utility billing accounts, there are an increase in aging delinquent accounts. Uh, ultimately, the restaurant sector is in the worst shape, um, but there are rising delinquent accounts across all, both resident and commercial. Um, so that's something that we'll need to be reviewing in those funds uh, and reserves for bad debt at a certain point. Um, parking, as the council will be discussing, I think, next week, um, parking has taken a, been turned upside down in the COVID era. Um, and so revenues are significantly down uh, because we haven't necessarily been enforcing things. Um, and ultimately we're bringing back programmatic review of the new Calav garage um, and the RPPs around that area next, um, next week. Ultimately, uh, this one, if there is a reduction in revenues versus expenses, which is expected, there is sufficient fund balance in these funds to cover these differences, um, at least for fiscal year 21. Uh, the capital bidding market was a topic of a lot of discussion over our budget process. Um, and really, there was the sentiment that maybe with the reduction um, and the downturn in the economy that we would see great savings in our bids. Um, and ultimately it's mixed. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a windfall in some areas. I think in general, we've talked with some of our colleagues, they have seen reductions in bids, but in other areas such as utilities, it's a competitive marketplace. Companies like PG&E continue to invest in their infrastructure. And so there really hasn't been significant changes uh, in that kind of cost perspective. General Capital Improvement Fund, another one that we discussed um, a lot, this has the 2014 council approved infrastructure plan projects like the public safety building, the Cal Ave garage, um, the fire stations and the 101 bike bridge. Um, that fund will require rebalancing. Um, when we go through the revenue estimates, you'll see that TOT has a revised outlook and will likely take a lot longer to recover given the orders associated with this, um, the health uh, health and safety. And so ultimately that fund will likely need rebalancing because it's currently balanced with two optimistic um, TOT estimates. So a quick snapshot, uh, trying to put all the general fund revenues on one, uh, one slide. So as we've talked about property tax, our biggest uh, revenue generator uh, is running at about budget. Um, so the budget did assume growth. Our um, assessed valuation role grew 7.7%. Um, and ultimately, if there are impacts to property tax, we will see them more significantly in the following year since there is a lag in that timing. Um, ultimately, we will see some downturn in our unsecured property tax um, or reassessments, uh, but for the most part, it's trending around budget. Sales tax is hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, trending above budget. The memo quotes um, a range between maybe two million to 9 million um, above the current budgeted estimate. As you can see, we took a significant reduction in that 40%. Um, and we are seeing a lot of down um, revenues as you saw in the Q2 report. But again, if um, the Q2 sales tax report was the, the, the largest drop, then ideally the report in Q3 uh, will show hopefully fingers crossed um, some level of recovery um, DOT is the one where we have a lot of risk, I would say. Um, and this is the one where if our revenues continue at the current monthly pace, um, we will likely not meet this revenue estimate by over 10 million. So a piece of that would be in capital infrastructure and a piece of that would be in the general fund, obviously, since this revenue source is shared between those two. Um, ultimately, when this estimate was created, we had assumed we would have a strict shelter in place through December with a quick bounce back since this revenue does is very elastic and it's quick to recover or react. Um, unfortunately, where we are at in this 
uh, in this health uh, emergency, frankly, I don't suspect we will see that kind of trend. Um, so at worst, like I said, uh, we may be short by about 10 million. And hopefully though, we will see it recover as we move through the months of this fiscal year. Um, the rest of them are little changes up and down. Um, you can kind of see DTT is doing a little bit better, but it's a super volatile revenue source. Um, charges for services and licenses and permits, um, as expected, would be down a little bit because we aren't able to offer all the services um, that we would historically be offering. Um, and the services that we are offering have to be adapted. So for example, the golf course, um, instead of having tee times every six minutes, they're now every 12 minutes. So even if we were operating at full capacity, we wouldn't be at the same quote full capacity as pre COVID periods. Um, and then other taxes and fines, this has parking citations in there as well as our return on investments. And obviously with the markets where they're at, uh, and with us not enforcing parking citations um, for the first quarter of the fiscal year, uh, they are trending down a little bit. So hopefully this provides some highlights uh, of where we're kind of, kind of feeling. And ultimately, in spite of all of those ups and downs, services do continue. Um, as we talked about, or as Ed mentioned in his overview, you know, we are really trying to support open spaces, um, and those activities that can be done in this environment. Um, library services, obviously, you, you've heard about our sidewalk services and the call center that continues. So although the libraries are not open, staff are doing a lot of the work that typically, frankly, a customer used to do um, as they process the materials, they set them up for pickups, they quarantine them for 96 hours, um, et cetera. Public safety continues to patrol, fire continues, um, their services, frankly, in spite of all of the wildfires and the additional stress and resources they've had for that. Um, planning and development permits, there's an interesting graph that we put in the um, report itself. Um, albeit they saw a significant drop uh, during the initial months of shelter in place. Uh, now that some of those have been lifted in the kind of June, July, August timeframe, their permits are going back to what were typical volume. Um, and what we have yet to see is, was that pent up demand from the drop in um, those kind of strict shelter in place periods of time? Or is that actually um, where we're back at from a new normal perspective? And ultimately only time will tell. Um, and staff continue obviously to work on a number of capital projects as you all saw, the big piece of our bike 101 bridge coming in um, and then ultimately soon the Calab garage completion. So overall, um, I would say that as Ed mentioned, we are some, some positive, some negative, um, but we're holding steady based on the strong work that this council frankly led the way through with staff and the community in May for some really tough discussions. Um, and ultimately from a staff perspective, we wouldn't necessarily recommend any adjustments to the budget at this time, but continue to track things um, and monitor them to see if we need to adjust things later. Um, with that, looking to the future, I'll turn it back to Ed to go over our community and economic recovery. Thank you very much, Director Nose. Just to, uh, briefly to, to provide um, a, a perspective and maybe a, a, a foundation for Council's discussion of next steps. We've previously had some discussion of recovery strategies and, and elements thereof. Uh, just want to share with you ongoing staff work that we uh, would like to bring back to you soon. Uh, and I'll talk about a schedule in a moment. But just in, to give you a, a thumbnail of it, we are uh, currently uh, compiling and looking at various sources for the macro trends, as well as sector specific economic disruptions or economic factors uh, that uh, as a community uh, may drive uh, key uh, uh, mid to long term effects that will be resulting from the pandemic. Uh, Director Nose pointed out several of them, including the hotel sector, the education sector, uh, certainly retail sales and the like that the, the council has talked about previously. Um, we're also working on our financial uh, and analytical uh, tools uh, for modeling and scenario 
planning in order to enable the council to do some what if analyses uh, regarding the trends as well as the potential uh, strategies uh, that the council may be discussing uh, in areas uh, that we might have impact, which is really the third uh, topic, which is what are those areas in which uh, the city as a uh, institution and as a market player uh, might leverage uh, its ability to impact or influence uh, that recovery. Again, uh, unlikely that will affect the economy as a whole, but there may be specific areas such as the council's uh, efforts to date around retail and restaurants uh, that could uh, demonstrate some impact. Next slide, please. As uh, again, uh, points of reference, we provided in your staff uh, report, a couple of examples, uh, one from San Jose, Silicon Valley, another from uh, the city and county of San Francisco that uh, again, the, don't expect you'd be able to read these. Uh, the material is in your packet, uh, as well as uh, from the original sources uh, that uh, have uh, fairly elaborate uh, descriptions of multi-point strategies. Uh, which, as you might expect, uh, for communities uh, and reflecting populations of a million or more uh, are somewhat complex and uh, nonetheless do provide some pointers uh, to areas uh, that uh, some of our neighbors have focused on uh, with respect to economic and community recovery. Next slide, please. So uh, with uh, these examples, as well as ongoing work uh, that we've been doing, uh, uh, oh, and I should have noted earlier, in conversation with Stanford University, as well as uh, looking to other thought leadership uh, uh, with respect to uh, those issues of macro trends uh, that, uh, again, subject to the council's areas of particular interest, might be suitable for bringing together as as a study session uh, for discussion on what those trends are, as well as, uh, again, what may be under our uh, sphere of influence, uh, so to speak, in uh, the pace and, and areas of emphasis. Uh, we would hope uh, to come back to you in the November, December timeframe uh, for discussion of elements of uh, community uh, an economic uh, recovery strategy. Certainly uh, would welcome council input on the process that might be appropriate in terms of community engagement, other academic and thought leadership engagement in uh, where uh, we might uh, focus our specific resources as well as leveraging the uh, interests and engagement of the community as a whole. We've got as shown on this chart, a number of ongoing uh, fiscal uh, related reports and actions coming to you, uh, including uh, noted on the first line here, uh, impact fees, fire medical services and parking, some actions for, that relate to your adopted budget that are really implementing your adopted budget. And so additional policy actions required in order to put these uh, revenue measures uh, in place, not, not again presupposing your uh, decisions on them, but do want to recognize that these are connected to actions already taken and the assumptions on which your bu current budget are, um, is, is built. And then with the upcoming reporting, uh, really wanting to dovetail the strategic work with uh, continuing monitoring of our fiscal situation in order to bring back for your discussion in the December, January timeframe, uh, some strategies and some options uh, that can form your actions for the upcoming budget, as well as uh, interim actions along the way. Next slide, please. Okay, and then finally, just back with the recommendation. So uh, Ms. Lose, please go ahead. No, so just going back to the purpose of tonight, uh, hopefully a status update uh, for the council and the public on where we are at financially, and then ultimately on items one through four, uh, discussion hopefully with, with the council on where we're at and any adjustments or uh, preferences or guiding principles to help the continued and frankly multi, multi-faceted uh, work that is ahead of us um, since we do have a number of financial reports as well as this recovery effort coming forward um, over the coming months. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, um, Vice Mayor. Thank you, thank you for that. Let's um, go to the public and see if there's any uh, public comment. 
Any members of the public that wish to speak on the council's budget, please raise your hand or dial star nine on your phone. At this time, we have one speaker, Sasan Golafshan. Uh, good evening, council members. Um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Sasan Golafshan. I'm the founder and CEO and operator of Form Fitness located at 445 Bryant Street, right next to the large garage. Um, I built this gym uh, as a studio initially over uh, two decades ago, and it has grown to become essentially the health center for the community. Um, I have been a tenant of the city for the past, I wanna say 16 years, um, and I have always paid our bills on time, utility, rent, taxes. Uh, I like to think that we are a prime example of a, a class act tenant. Uh, unfortunately, just like many other businesses, uh, we were forced to shut down and um, with not much help, the PPP came, but it was meaningless for us because uh, we essentially just took our employees off unemployment, paid them to sit around. Um, and then once PPP, PPP was done, um, all was done. Now that we're open, uh, we're, we just moved to 25% capacity, but unfortunately a lot of people are either too afraid to come in or reluctant to risk. Uh, needless to say, the business has been demolished just like many others. Um, it is my hope uh, to ask the council to consider uh, doing what the council has been asking landlords to do, which is to work with the tenants. Um, and my personal request is to essentially forgive the rent that was back due and also work with us in a percentage, uh, gross percentage type uh, rent moving forward in order for us to function. Uh, as you know, all studios and gyms have either gone out of business or they're not gonna open. Um, I personally would appreciate the opportunity to uh, see if we can get that help so we can continue to serve the community at large. Thank you, Sasan. Our next speaker is Pat Burt. Thank you and uh, thanks to the council and the staff for all the hard work that they continue to do on this. Um, I sent to the council uh, today a set of uh, written comments, which I hope you've had a chance to uh, review some. Uh, briefly, I'd like to say that um, this is now the opportunity for the council to move from what was by necessity a, a reactive, uh, urgent uh, response in the budget in May and June to uh, moving toward a more strategic and proactive set of actions. Um, central to that is, um, uh, I would say that in the community over the last months, as we've had many discussions around uh, the uh, campaign for the city council, uh, there has been virtual unanimity uh, by the community, the council candidates, and the press around the concept that we should be slowing down uh, the rate of our capital projects to be able to conserve resources for services and uh, for contingencies. Um, I'd also like to um, really focus you on uh, something that Sasan had just alluded to is how do we get to the point where uh, buildings indoor buildings, which we're starting to migrate toward, uh, are conceived of as safe and healthy. Uh, and I'd say that the practices that we would take will also benefit even beyond the pandemic uh, for fire seasons, for flu prevention and all of that. The county has actually has, uh, provided a four page plan uh, that I encourage you to review. And PAUSD has actually moved forward with a, a, a strong program that has been a combination of uh, audits and uh, testing of their facilities, uh, supplements to their HVAC system to uh, improve the air quality and then new additional systems. Indoor air quality is not a binary issue. It can be greatly improved and that's going to be essential to us um, 
being able to provide our services and to our economic recovery of our private sector and our, our nonprofits. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Our next speaker is Rebecca Eisenberg. Yes. Thanks so much. First, I wanna thank Mr. Burt for um, repeating so many arguments I've been making so long. Thank you, Pat, for agreeing with me on these important issues. That really means a lot. That said, so I know that we're in a really tough spot here. We're in a tough spot in part because of the seven to zero vote that you all made to take the business tax off of November's ballot and move it to, well, the soonest time it'll really be any easy way to add it is in two years. So that really puts you all in a tough bind. And I feel bad for you. Although to be fair, your city staff, including your city manager did urge you to keep that business tax on the ballot. I talked with them for a while and asked them about it. And I understand that they really truly strongly always supported that. And um, you exercised your discretion, which you do have to disagree with your city staff and to do what you decide to do in your own discretion, rather than give the city staff reign to do whatever city staff wants to do, including Mr. Shikata, who I actually do believe has been doing a great job. So I guess all I wanna say here is that please, please stop cutting community services and services for seniors and services for children and services who help keep our community safe with mental health services and with medical services and with COVID services and services that create the green city that we can be. Please just don't make things worse for residents. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. Bye. Thank you, Rebecca. Our next speaker is Aram James. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, briefly in response to something Rebecca Eisenberg just said, and that was that she complimented Ed Chikata on a job well done. But I didn't hear any of you jump in to tell her that she couldn't compliment a city official, a, uh, a member of council. So I want you to pay attention to that. You can't have it both ways. If you can't criticize, which I totally disagree with, and the Constitution suggests that you, you can't limit the right of citizens to criticize government officials by name, uh, read New York Times versus Sullivan and 9-0 decision by Justice, written by Justice Brennan. But so you get to compliment or clap for people at the city council that you're complimenting, but you can't criticize. That's not the way the First Amendment works. So please show a little respect for the First Amendment. If you're gonna cut somebody off for criticizing an official, then you gotta do the same. The First Amendment is neutral in that regard. Okay, uh, thanks for letting me say my piece. Thank you, Aaron. Any other speakers wishing to speak on the item regarding the budget, please raise your hands or dial star nine. Vice Mayor Du Bois, there's no other speaker. Okay, hey, thank you. Okay, let's go to council. Um, let's definitely do one round of questions. Um, and it's a pretty wide ranging item, but let's just do some five minute rounds of questions in kind of all, all the different areas. Um, does anybody wanna go first? All right, thank you. Councilmember Cormack. Seeing none, I guess we'll go in a semblance of alphabetical order. Um, I just wanna emphasize the city manager's uh, headline. Um, I remember when we were making this decision we had A, B, and C, and I, I think staff was hoping for B, and I, I certainly understand why, but uh, a few of us veered right to C, which is the first uh, letter in conservative approach, and we're, we're clearly in the right ballpark. So. Um, I, I, I think that was a collective effort and I, I, I wanna recognize everybody who participated in that. Um, okay, questions. Um, big one, 
So how and when are we going to adjust the capital infrastructure plan for the lower transient occupancy tax levels? I see some vague things in the staff report, but let, let's get down to brass tax on that. Uh, I can answer for fiscal year 2021 um, that I believe right now, based on where we're at, uh, we would likely first look at rebalancing at mid-year uh, when we have at least six months worth of data to see kind of where the trend is at from a TOT perspective. Um, and then obviously guaranteed, we'll have way more information when we look at the five-year plan as part of the budget process. Um, so if I'm supposed to feed it into the typical budget process, but obviously um, Ed has more on how we can tackle that. Well, I was just going to acknowledge that the, uh, well, hopefully immediate decision that the council will be um, uh, potentially making is related to the public safety building. Uh, we do have uh, the project out to bid with bids expected at the end of the month. And so if everything falls into place, that decision could be before you by the end of the calendar year. And really one that needs to, a decision that needs to be made within the context of all of the variables uh, that we're discussing. So and again, recognizing uh, the unknown of the bid amounts as well as uh, where we will be with respect to both TOT and uh, feedback from the market on our um, financing documents. We'll have that as a uh, immediate next step. Okay, so we have to make a big decision before we're going to look at the whole plan. Is that what I just heard? Well, you'll be able to make a big decision and in the context of what we can tell you about where the different uh, revenue sources are. Again, what you choose with respect to future priorities and additional uh, rebalancing, I think is, is that next step that Director Nose was describing. Okay, well, um, I think separate from the overall level, the way that we track um, the funding of specific things in the plan, I think, I think we're gonna need to spend some more time on that, which I think there's general agreement on. Um, okay, page 17, just sort of going in like order here. Um, I see we um, have moved the RPP permit sales entirely online and by telephone. We've gotten a few complaints about that. And I wondered if staff wanted to just respond to those. Sure, um, I'd be happy to take that with my other ASD side of the, the, my hat on. Um, ultimately, I believe those complaints are coming from the implementation of the new permit system. Um, and so with any system implementation, there are absolutely hiccups. Um, and in these specific instances, we're doing a phased approach where we're doing the smaller districts first, so we can learn from those and iterate on it as we then move to the larger districts. Um, so, and uh, some of these first districts that we've done um, historically have all been done in person and we didn't even have necessarily an online system for them. So we are making a larger change management leap from that perspective. Um, so hope, you know, goal is to continue to learn from this. Uh, Philip can help on the programmatic side of things. I just have the revenue collections people. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, so yes, essentially what Kylie said is it's a, a bit of a change for people and you know we're trying it in two of our smaller RPP districts, but it is a bit of a change for people switching to this all online um, system. Um, however, you know, we're working with the vendor to make sure that they have somebody there to answer calls and that they're um, helping people out. They're also creating a video that will help people to understand how to set up and create their accounts and, and get navigate through the system. I just want to note that for the past at least four years, we've been receiving complaints about the prior vendor uh, for their online system. So you know, we're, we're still working through kinks and we really want to make sure we work out all the kinks before we, you know, send it out to all of the RPP districts. Um, the one last thing I will say is the most common issue that we've had is that when people register for their accounts, they end up getting their email um, sent, their confirmation email sent to their junk mailbox. And so the most common troubleshooting thing that we've worked through with them is getting them to check their junk email to find their confirmation email. So, um, you know, our parking staff and um, the contractor, um, which is Duncan Solutions, 
have been um, very, very uh, quick to help people. Um, they have a phone number that's available on the website um, that will help. Um, if they call, they can help um, get help navigating any issues that they encounter. Okay, thanks. It sounds like uh, checking your spam folder is like checking to make sure that you're unmuted, right? <laughs> okay, great. Um, I see that my time is up on this round. And I am unmuted. Um, let's go to Council Member Philsett. Yeah, thanks very much. A um, couple questions. I realize that you know it's pretty pretty sketchy as of now, but he uh, uh, said sales taxes uh, run. Looks like it might run a little bit higher than, than budget, which is good. Um, how's the shopping center doing? Do we have enough granularity to to see that? I will ask, uh, actually, probably Thomas, um, our consultant, to help us out with that, um, with the caveat that he will also reiterate the data we have is in a transitionary period and therefore. Sure. Uh, I understand. Grain of Epsom salt. Yeah. yeah. Thomas? Sure. Um, good evening, Council. So at this point, uh, your Q2 stats, as you, as you may have seen from, from the report we provided, uh, were all pretty ugly uh, kind of across the board. So, in the, and there's, there's no distinction between the shopping center and, and the rest of the city. So okay. you know, since a lot of it was closed during, during part of Q2, the, the kind of the height of the, the sheltering and the quarantine, um, that's reflected in your numbers. So. Going forward, um, we're, we're optimistic that you're going to be significantly better than that. I think it was 20.5 you, you had in the budget. Um, but it's, it's really the Q3 numbers that we think are going to provide uh, a better snapshot of, of what, uh, what kind of, I don't, I don't want to call it a new normal because things seem to change every week, right. but, uh, but, but a better idea of, of what, what the fiscal year might might uh, might bring so it, statewide uh, things things have been tracking much better I think than many had anticipated, mm -hmm. uh, but there are some some serious differences from community to community. So uh, in particular, I think we're most interested for for you guys in in new auto sales as as well as is where your uh, your retail is uh, in Q3, and, and that that will give us a good indication of how, how the, how the year might. Be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw the auto sale thing. So yeah, we're, you know, we're all got our trying to get our crystal ball algorithm out and so forth. Uh, but, um, but yeah, it's uh, a little cloudy. Have a little yeah, cloudy. You don't, you don't have, you don't have explicit data on the, sh on the shopping center itself. Uh, that's, um, not, that's not, not off the top, top, not off the top of my okay. head right now. Okay. All right. And then the second question was, uh, you know, it looked like the one bright spot in the whole picture was equipment leasing. <laughs> right? And uh, why is that? And should we expect it to continue? And what is it? So, so leasing is, it's, it's a little odd. It's in the B2B category. And that's part sure. of the your B2B category uh, perform pretty well. Uh, leasing is, is mostly auto leasing for, uh, for Palo Alto. For most communities, it, it has to do with auto leasing. So you've got, so that's, I was wondering that. So you've got auto leasing in there. It's not strictly, as auto leasing is in leasing, it's not in auto sales. Yes, correct. Okay. Um, cool. All right. Thanks very much. Yes. Okay. Uh, Council member Koo. Um, I wanted to ask, so we had a hiring freeze uh, when we were start when we started with the um, the budget discussions, um, have we started rehiring back again? Has there been yeah? You know, we still do have a freeze. We do have exceptions uh, that do allow uh, essential some selected positions to go through. We've established a, a committee which includes Director Nose, uh, Rumi Portillo, our Chief People Officer and Assistant City Manager Muni Placonchi Zinheni. And so they review all requests for exemption from the hiring freeze and are, are handled on a case by case basis. So how do you classify who are essentials and I mean, who you hire back, you know, what is the committee's um, um, priorities on who, who is hired? 
I believe. I, uh, I, yes, Ms. Would you like me to give a try? Hi, uh, yes, um, Rumi Perkyo, Chief. Hi. Um, Yes, we do have some criteria that we look at, but we are really looking at health and safety issues and certainly those that are maintaining essential services. Examples of the types of um, turnover that we have approved for uh, filling would be positions that are at our uh, water treatment plant, for example, um, that are on 24 hour operations and they require um, skilled um, or specialized people to uh, keep the, the operations running. Uh, we also have uh, some uh, public works positions, for example, that may uh, be critical um, if left unfilled. Uh, so uh, we would look pretty carefully at those. Um, uh, overall, we've had very few exemptions um, during this closure period. Um, and um, we are really thoroughly scrutinizing those. But for the most part, uh, we would see um, you know, the essential functions that are in those areas, like I, I mentioned, and also in our utilities areas, because uh, those are, uh, many of those are necessary for um, continuity of operations. Okay, thank you. So about how many has been hired back now? Or hired, not back, but hired? Hmm. Hmm. Kylie and I are both kind of squinting. Let's see, let's see. Um, I'd have to go back and see um, in the- You could get a number on that. Okay. Um, yeah. Now with the, um, I noticed that for the police um, from the uh, attrition, they're, they're already there. So there's no more layoffs in their department, correct? That's correct. Okay. So now we have in fire, there's still, I, I believe there's three that is a possibility of being cut at the end of the year, December 31. And those would be the newer firefighters, correct? It's not a seniority basis, yes. Okay. Um, so I was wondering if we can examine uh, the Fire Prevention Bureau. You know, obviously there is something that when they go out and fulfill their um, state mandates of inspecting the buildings, there's a billing that they can uh, do. And potentially that's a place where they can uh, uh, have revenue. And would that be someplace, a way for them to um, generate that funding in order to keep the three? The um, uh, I'll have Chief Blackshire explain the, the details of this, but ultimately the fire inspections are um, the ones that are happening from a development center perspective um, are intended to be on a cost recovery basis. So we should be um, charging for those inspections based on the permits um, and therefore offsetting the cost um, for, for inspection type work. Right. Um, that's for the development services. But then there is also uh, their mandate for uh, SB 1205, which is to inspect the older buildings and to make it compliant and to um, make recommendations on safety and so forth. Um, so are we, are we um, in compliance, number one? And then number two, if they go out and do these inspections, can the, can the revenue go to a fire department versus staying over at uh, planning and transportation? Yes, let oh, me I'm ask uh, our I, chief. I forget their name. Blackshire to, to respond. I believe we actually had some of this discussion during the budget process itself. Right. Chief Blackshire. Good evening, council. So what I can comment on is you asked if we're compliant. And uh, the goal is to be compliant this year, as you know that for some time during shelter in place, we were not able to do inspections of some of these uh, state mandated facilities. And so the goal as of right now is we're playing catch up. Um, so again, I don't know exactly where we will be at the end of the fiscal year in compliance, but um, we are working towards that goal. But there's, uh, there were several months where inspections were not done that they would typically be done. And uh, there's fewer people doing those inspections as well, because as you know, we cut the Prevention Bureau by two uh, personnel. Um, so the, the timing and the, um, and the delay is impacting our ability to, to, to meet that standard. But the goal is to get there uh, at some point. 
Um, in regards to whether the money can go towards um, the attrition ramp, uh, typically the revenue is in the uh, development services, uh, so it can be uh, cost neutral. And so I'm, I think Kylie would probably be able to chime in better on that, but my understanding is that the revenue is not um, geared towards the fire department personnel and salaries. It would pay for the fire department salaries that are in the development center. Um, so obviously their fires staffing is actually kind of split between two uh, lines of services only because of the uniqueness of it where there is the suppression side that sits in the fire department budget, but there are also the costs associated with inspections that sit in development center. Um, and so again, the development center, we do try and keep it at a cost recovery level. Um, so those fees would be recovering the costs for those services. We aren't able to charge a fee um, and then have that fee be reallocated towards a different service because um, ultimately that would be a tax um, and would require a, a, a voter a voter ballot measure. Um, you know, from a cost recovery perspective, uh, the costs need to directly support, or rather, the revenues need to directly support the costs of delivering that service. That's five minutes. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Councilmember Koo. Uh, Councilmember Ness. I think you might be on mute, Liz. Thanks. So it would seem as though saving those fire positions would be important. And um, let's start there for a minute, but then go on to what, and I think we just heard one of the candidates come on and say, the perception out in the community is why are we putting up big buildings? Why don't we cut back on some of our infrastructure and put more back into the services that are going into the community? And I, th I think we need to listen to that. I think that's really valid. Um, in addition to all this, you know, COVID makes people a little bit, a little bit more extreme than usual. And, and I think we're seeing that. So also <laughs> when you're, at a restaurant in California Avenue and you look over and you see this high rise garage, people are saying, come on, you know, are you really going to put up another enormous building right next to that when the restaurants are struggling on the street below? So I think we need to think something about the optics, not just the rest, but it's, does it look to our community like we are serving them in the way they deserve to be served? So, the big infrastructure we can come back to a little later, but I wanna know how do we save those fire positions? Well, I can- There's gotta be a way. Sure, uh, and a running theme that I probably should have included in the presentation, but it slipped my mind is ultimately, um, staff is doing their best across the board to appropriately, effectively, and efficiently allocate resources. Um, so, and Chief Blackshire can talk about this more. Um, we're, including the fire department, reviewing every expense possible to try and find additional savings as we go through our normal course of business uh, so that we can identify funds that we could reallocate towards extending that time frame. Obviously, that's an ongoing effort. It's not a guarantee. Um, and ultimately, it may require some additional funds but whether it be reallocation of janitorial services or uh, reprioritizing expenses in departments or the hiring freeze, creating additional vacancy savings um, or trying to staff and open our parks like the Magical Bridge, all departments are really taking an eye towards how do I work within the existing resources that I have reprioritize based on this response that's necessary um, in order to meet the demands within existing levels. I'm not saying that's gonna be feasible across the board, um, but I will say that's the first step um, that staff will always take and has been taking as we, we try and extend things like this. So, because we may not be discussing this again until the end of the year, which is when you're indicating that the fire 
whomever it is, firefighters, would would be done. Um, it sounds as though we need to give you a direction to save that tonight. Am I right? If council wants us to extend the layoff date or the attrition ramp um, and potential date, if we are in that position by the end of the year, then I would say yes, um, some direction needs to be provided. Um, I'm not sure how specific it necessarily needs to be. It doesn't need to be allocate X. Um, but if the council made a motion that said something to the effect of should staff be able to identify additional funds in order to um, extend the attrition ramp until staff is able to get back with say the mid-year budget review um, for council's review and action, um, then staff can take that uh, motion and the extra time, frankly, uh, to then follow back with the council. So when the time comes, um, Vice Mayor, I will bring that up and make it a motion because, um, you know, I think, you know, there's so many other things that are important, but if you ask, if you remember in our survey, what do you, what do you want the most? They want police and fire. You want protection from the bad guys and they want protection from fire and so forth. And this has been a terrible year for fire. So I, I'd be embarrassed if we said, we have to let three firefighters go um, when we've been sending firefighters other places to, to fight fires. So um, I know I'm gonna come up on my time in a minute, but I hope we will also during this discussion, if we keep going around, talk about our big buildings and what that looks like to the public. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Tanaka. So I'm going to kind of echo what was said earlier, which is, you know, during the, during the budget hearings in, in May, I talked about why not delay some of these capital projects, especially the public safety building. Um, I think the answer at that time was, well, we could still afford it. We just cut some positions. Now it's really clear that our TOT is not coming in, right? It's, it's, it's really short. You talk to any of the hotel people and they'll, and they'll tell you um, it's really dire right now. Um, so that's, that's no surprise. Uh, that the TOT hasn't matched our expectation. So I guess I, I don't understand why, I mean, why keep proceeding forward? I mean, I don't think we could afford it right now. It doesn't seem to make sense for all the reasons mentioned before and the reasons why I mentioned back in, in May. So why, um, why, why not stop it tonight? Like why wait longer? Because it's not like we were seeing our hotels come roaring back. Business travel still hasn't happened. Stanford's not open. Um, we have a lot of needs like fire and other other services in the community. Why, why wait more time? And I, I, I guess I, I just don't understand the answer that was given earlier. So I, I, I also would support doing this and doing it tonight rather than waiting longer because it's, it's not like it's we're having some sort of magical recovery right now. Um, moving on, I think the the um, second thing is uh, the city. Um, has asked a lot of the local landlords to um, work with the small local businesses to kind of tie them through, uh, do deferral of rent, um, actually um, forgiveness of, 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 of rent, of, of lease payments. And a lot of those uh, local landlords actually have done that. Um, and I guess I'm just trying to understand how do we as a city ask uh, landlords who also, also have mortgages to pay that they should you know, do this for their tenants to help the small local businesses kind of pull through. But then on the city side, we, we don't do that. So I guess I wanted to understand kind of, I mean, we heard one business owner who called in, uh, Sasan, uh, about his, his, his small local business. And I, I guess I, I just want to understand how, does, how do we do that? How do we tell private landlords, yeah, you go, you know, um, eat dirt on, on the uh, rent payments from your your tenants, but then on us we 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 don't right. We we are we're from understand from Sasan, we're actually looking potentially to foreclose on this business. So I guess how does that work? Maybe can the city manager talk a little bit about that? Well, first I would uh, clarify that we have not asked any landlords to take a loss or to, in, to your term, eat dirt. Um, we are uh, working with our tenants as we have all 
partners uh, that we have throughout our system. So I'm quite frankly not sure where to go with your question beyond that, Councilmember. Okay. Well, I, I guess um, uh, maybe 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 it's <clears throat> maybe we didn't uh, do a uh, official city vote. I mean, a city council vote on it. But I, I think in the spirit of trying to also be a good landlord, I think we should try to work with our tenants on, on these issues because it's very, very challenging times, not just for this tenant, but for a lot of others as well. Um, so that's, that's where I'm coming from on it. Um, can we bring up slide five um, from the presentation tonight? Yes, I'll work on that one second. Okay. Um, so as you, as you bring that up, one thing uh, I thought was interesting is, um, whereas you, I think, uh, I guess, Kylie, you talked about the imbalance of we collected only 13.5% of the revenue, um, but we've spent about 23% of the money, right? So we've almost spent twice as much as we collected. And um, how do we, like, how do we handle that gap? Do we just foresee that the, um, I know that the county has delayed um, some of the collection of, of revenue, but how does, how does that, um, uh, this is the first bullet after the general fund, but what's, what's the thought behind that? Like, how do we, how do we make that whole? Because if we're spending money faster than we're making it, it seems like, don't we need to make some adjustments somehow to make things whole? Um, if we were to project that by the end of the year, that that imbalance would stay, then I would say, yes, absolutely. We should be making adjustments, but this is just a snapshot. Um, it's not even a full quarter. Um, so there are so many timing differences associated with the number of revenue streams that we have um, that it is common to have an imbalance on any given month. Sometimes we may be higher on the revenue side than the expense side. Um, you know, some revenues come in every month, like TOT or utility user tax. Other revenues come in depending on when a transaction occurs, like documentary transfer tax. Um, and our biggest revenue source, property tax, comes in twice a year. Uh, our first payment doesn't come until October. Um, and the second payment comes at the beginning of the new calendar year. So uh, imbalances are expected. Um, and staff manages, frankly, Taryn, our um, debt treasury investment manager, manages cash flow um, with staff to look at, you know, the typical flows um, and to plan our bank account available liquid cash uh, to address these. It's part of our normal course of business. So have we ever had, um, I mean, this is typical that we could see that the expenses are twice percentage of the bud budget. Is that, is that typical or is that, is this, um, what, is, what does it normally look like? Well, and so uh, you are actually striking an issue that we had as we were trying to write this report um, this is, since it's a preliminary report, we don't have a prior year benchmark for this exact period of time. Uh, we'll be able to provide that when we do the Q1 report in December. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I'll just, that struck me, which, which is first, it's great that we got some money from the CARES Act, but we spent $3 million. So where's that extra, where's that extra two point something million dollars come from? Sure. Um, it's uh, come from existing budgeted funds, uh, reallocation of resources, uh, including, frankly, the bulk of this is staff, right? We have redeployed uh, a big component of our workforce, including... No I, no, I know that. I guess, sorry, Kyla, what I'm asking is, how do we make up the shortfall, the $2 million shortfall? Well, is this what sort of budget for? The shortfall is baked into a lot of your um, financial status already. Okay, okay, um, okay that's fine. Um, I'm running out of time, so I just wanted to... Um, now, um, I realized that there's a delay in getting our sales tax, but can we employ some sampling techniques where we can maybe get a basket of retailers in our city and these willing ones, and then ask them to share, you know, and confidentially, we wouldn't you know, make this data public, but at least so we could get a better sampling, an earlier forecast of of how, you know, how is it going to look for us? So rather than having to wait a really long time to get, you know, conclusive numbers, we could do a sampling. We could ask maybe like 20, 30 retailers in our city as just a sampling so that we can, we could get a sense as to how things are headed right now versus just kind of seeing our hands and hoping for the best. 
I, um, I would argue we're not sitting on our hands hoping for the best, as you say. We, we are actively working with our business community um, and the reports. Um, in terms of going door to door, um, different businesses generate different uh, sales tax revenues. So I'm not sure how effective a mattering yeah. like that would be. Um, I can ask Thomas if he has any additional information on that, knowing that you're trying to manage time as well. You know, at the same time, I believe this is what I referenced in the presentation, that we are working on our analytical capabilities to help the council do some what ifs. And quite frankly, uh, that may be more effective, at, at least at this point, it appears that it would be more effective than trying to reconstruct uh, a sampling technique from ground up. I guess my point is just more that we could get more direct information faster by asking a handful, maybe not a handful, maybe like 20, 30 retailers. And it, it just would be a way for us to extrapolate what will happen. Um, it's not gonna be totally conclusive, but at least we have some sort of idea versus right now we have to wait a really long time. There's a big lag, lag factor. And so it makes it hard for us to make decisions. And so right now we already have some early indication that the TOT is not looking good. I mean, there's an incredible variance, right? A two to nine million dollars variance on the sales tax. And um, I mean, that's a pretty, pretty high error bar, right? Um, and what if, you know, it's such a high error bar that makes me wonder, it could also go the other way too. And if we could talk to some of the local retailers, at least the ones that are willing to share point of sales data for this year and last year, we could get a sense as to um, how's it really looking. Now, it's not gonna be hundred percent conclusive. There's gonna be errors, but at least it's better than what we have now, which is, we just don't know, right? We're, we're guessing right now. Okay, I think my time's up, so I'll ask more on the next round. Thank you, Greg. Um, I'll ask some quick questions. Um, one thing I didn't really see was um, what services can't we provide right now? And you know, do we have any information on demand and needs and where we're not not matching? I think you know a lot of things were cut that we can't really offer, but we also have other examples like the magical bridge, but can staff respond to that? Are there things that we know people want that we can't do right now? Well, I think much of it is the in-person services, whether they be libraries, in-person uh, community services department um, activities, um, and again, to a large extent, those have been converted to virtual or alternative services. But uh, there, there are certainly everything that has been done in person that would fall into that category. But yeah, it's not clear that people are gonna send their kids to a group class right now. So I was looking for a little more, maybe nuance of things that would be possible, but we're not able to do. You mean in terms of, uh, let's see if there were additional resources, but still, shelter in place or, or socially distant? Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Well, I suspect if you if we were to pick every department, they'd probably be able to identify a few. Uh, let's see, I'll, I'll perhaps open the invitation to the department directors if there were specific examples that folks wanted to suggest. Yeah, I maybe mean, I'll get to my other questions because that'll take okay. my time, but it would be good to get that, get an indication of you know, what people are asking for that we're not able to do. Um, so it sounded like some capital project bids are down, maybe not so much in utilities. Could we get a summary report of capital project bids? I, th I think that would be really useful to see. Maybe I ask our uh, Public Works Director, Brad Eggleston to comment if you'd like to at this point. If not, certainly we could uh, follow up with that report. Uh, good evening, Council, and uh, good question, Vice Mayor. Uh, I, I don't have all those figures in front of me now. I think we could provide a report. We, we have been tracking bid information. Uh, just in general, what I would say is that on multiple um, street paving and repair uh, type projects where we've got bids, we've seen them come in fairly significantly under our estimates, uh, kind of in the range of maybe 10 to 20 percent under estimate. Um, we, I know we have had one uh, parks project that went to bid where we had uh, multiple bids 
and a low bidder that was essentially at our estimate and uh, dropped out of the process so that the rest of the bids were above the estimate and we ended up not moving forward with that project. So that's a quick snapshot, but, but certainly we can provide some more information. Yeah, maybe in the next meeting, it'd be good to see that as well. Um, and then I also heard that, you know, services have been harder to deliver and I wanted to understand if we saw the flip side of that at all. Did Was there nothing we do that we actually saw maybe productivity improvements by moving online or we could do it cheaper or faster? If I could ask uh, our planning development services director, John Late, to speak to the online plan submittal and how that has been going. Let's see if John's available to comment. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, that was a, a, a function of, uh, you know, needing to do the work and not being able to uh, meet people um, in the office to do that. So we did stand up that remote operation. And, and for the most part, um, it, uh, it helped us at the triage moment where we needed to um, sort of respond to that situation. Uh, and then since then, we've um, been now uh, trying to make refinements to that uh, online permit system as uh, we started, you know, um, finding out that there were some, you know, initial uh, challenges with that initial um, program. But um, over the past couple of months, we've done a lot to really stand that program up. We've got uh, instructional videos that are about to go online and we've had uh, some outreach engagement. Um, and so it's, it's actually a pretty good system now. Um, that's not to say it doesn't have its, its issues, but we're still working through that. Um, yeah. But it's a, it's a service that um, is completely remote and um, you know, for the most part, it's been working out. Yeah, it's good to hear. I mean, it sounds like mostly things got harder, but you know, I, would, I would hope that maybe a few things got a little easier. Um, the last question I had was, uh, now that we're allowing some indoor dining, are we moving to reopen the golf course cafe, as well as the cafe and city hall. Uh huh. Perhaps uh, in, if Kristen O'Kane's available to respond to the golf course, I think the uh, city hall um, cafe has uh, other issues that are still in the works with the uh, tenant improvements. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that question. Um, I actually d don't know the answer if they're looking to open indoors. Um, at the reduced capacity, but I will look into that and um, can get back to you. I, I would note, if I could, Vice Mayor, that as I mentioned uh, the, in my city manager's report, the indoor requirements for, or the requirements for indoor dining are actually still pretty stringent and requiring the uh, diners to be from the same household, as well as uh, requires registration of the guests so that should contact tracing be necessary, that the restaurant has the ability to, to do that tracing. So it's, it's actually a fairly restrictive uh, ability at the moment. But I'm sure we're going to start talking some more about uh, tenants and rents and things. So helping people get going be important. Okay, let's go, um, I guess, to another round. We can make it potential motions as well as questions. Um, Councilmember Niss, I think your hand stayed up the whole time. I don't yeah. know. Well, I, yes, I love having my hand up. I just... <laughs> I can't remember to bring it back down. So, so let's start with a couple of things. Is Geo around? Could we pop him up? Like magic, I'm sure. Wait a minute to see. There he is. There you are. <laughs> Hi, Geo. So, so I will tell you what I can remember. I was up in Calistoga and I called Geo to say, where is this fire going? Literally because it was so awful there. Um, you, could, you just couldn't breathe. And he was terrific. He looked it up, he figured it out. And frankly, we got out of there as well. So how many, how many, uh, how many firefighters did you send off this year to help others with their fires? So we sent, uh, we responded to a total of seven mutual aid requests and each of those requests is a unit with four personnel. So doing the math, um, 
every 28 firefighters. And we also sent a single resource who's training to be a strike team leader with one of the strike teams. So that's seven different deployments on several different fires. I can look them up, but it was everything from the LNU to the SCU, the Glass Fire, the Crete, the August. I mean, it was it's several fires across the state um, from Monterey County all the way to um, near Sacramento. And you guys answered the call. So you Correct. know where this is going. So um, Kylie, I'm gonna look at you. What kind of emotion do you need so that we don't have up on the screen um, three fire um, looking at attrition? Can you help me out? Sure. Uh, <laughs> I tried to draft something. So obviously this is subject to your uh, what your desire is ultimately in the will of the council. But if uh, the council made a motion and approved something such as authorize the extension of the attrition ramp for um, firefighter positions through February 2021 um, and direct staff to identify uh, a cost neutral options. Um, I would make that a motion, but why end it in February? Uh, for, well, again, the timeline is at the discretion of the council. Um, I will say in terms of staff's ability to find two months worth of extension costs is a lot more at a net zero perspective is probably a lot more feasible than if we extend it beyond that. Also specifically February, because we should be coming back with our mid-year budget review with the council when we'll be able to provide more information on where we're at. Because ultimately, you know, part of this is, is what is the attrition pace going to be? Um, we, as much as we don't know our uh, revenue numbers, um, Chief Blackshire can discuss, we, we don't necessarily know what individual employees plans are. Um, and so I hear that. However, if I'm one of those firefighters and my, and this is rather tenuous, I might start looking around at something else. Mm -hmm. So I would like to make that motion, but I would like to extend it until the end of the third quarter um, and see if I get a second to that. End of March, right? Yes, to the end of March. I'd be happy to second that if I understood the um, amount of money we're discussing. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think Ms. perhaps Director Noze can share that with us. I was going to ask that and then I got a little scared that maybe it was so much that we didn't even want to know. I want to so, know. Yes. <laughs> so, <All right>. uh, <laughs> um, I'm rounding. So Chief Blackshire, I believe it's about 20000 a month um, for total cost per position. Yeah, it's about 17000 per firefighter. So. Per, per month? Yeah. Per month. Yeah. So 17 times six. Um, 150,000. 100,000. Did I do that right? Eric says so, yes. So. Yeah. So, Ed, um, so. Councilmember Cormack, do you want to? So yes, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to second that. I would like to discuss with staff whether or not um, that needs to be done in the with the cost neutral or if they need us to allocate um, some money from the council reserve to a contingent fund. Good question. And you, if you would like to think about it for a moment, that's certainly fine. Um, I guess the other question, um, Council Member Niss, and perhaps this is a question for the Vice Mayor, is we have a lot of things to cover tonight. Is it the Vice Mayor's wish that we do these sort of in these four sections, or would you prefer to have a, an overall motion? Let's try to do one motion if we can. Okay. okay. I think we're pretty early in the process then, Council Member Niss. I'll just say I think there are a fair number of other questions and topics we haven't discussed yet. Um, are you pulling your second from this? I'm not pulling my second. I'm suggesting you withdraw this while we go through the other topics and that will give um, staff um, a moment to figure out if we should do it in this manner or if we should use the council reserve. Why don't we, why don't we keep this and just amend it? We go. Oh, Christmas tree it? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how many things we'll actually have. And okay, all right, then, um, that's fine. 
Happy to second. Oh. And that was five minutes. <laughs> Good timing, Monique, because I didn't get to my next question. <laughs> Go ahead, Liz, why don't you continue? Oh, great, thank you. So I want to come to go from the 150,000, I want to go to the um, public safety building because I know the public is really interested in this. Would someone uh, make a case for that at this point? Well, I would make the case that currently having the project out for bids would not be the time to say halt. Uh, let's see what the bids come back at as one uh, data point. Would also remind the council and uh, look to Kylie to correct me as needed that uh, the primary uh, financing source for this is the uh, increase in the transient occupancy tax or hotel tax, um, which was, and I'll watch my words here, uh, is essentially dedicated to capital needs. And as such, if there's a expectation of reallocating that to operating uh, expenses that that is within the discretion of the council, uh, but would be a decision that we'd want to be made within the context of any commitments uh, to the capital program. Um, so that said, uh, the analysis that we do plan to bring back to you in evaluating the bids is one of uh, risk and, and recognizing that, uh, again, as has been pointed out, the risk associated with the TOT is significant and really would want to provide good information for the council to consider. Um, I would note that we have, uh, and again, I'll look to Director uh, Eggleston to correct me if I misspeak here, but uh, we have uh, requested uh, or included as a part of the bid package uh, requirement of extended bid period, bid validity period, I think of 120 days, such that once the bids come in, we will try to provide as much time as possible for the council's consideration of that decision before needing to make it. So I'll, I'll wait that's, for either. That's somewhat reassuring. Um, and I'm going to leave that to all my colleagues to deal with next year. But um, in the meantime, we're struggling with 150,000 and yet looking at many millions to do the PSB. So as I said earlier, sometimes it's the optics that make it difficult. And um, however, there's an election in a couple of weeks which should just straighten it all out. Thank you, Council Member Nis, uh, Council Member Phil Seth. Yeah, thanks very much and uh, I, I, I'm just noticing that this highlights that even though we're all Democrats, we still got to not spend more money than we have. Um, the, uh, um, on the, so on the public safety building, um, I don't think we ought to make a decision on, uh, on that tonight. And uh, I actually don't think we ought to tinker with the capital plan tonight. Um, uh, on the public safety building, uh, you know, I'd like to see where the bids come in. And I'd like to see whatever we do uh, in the context of a whole capital plan, including scenarios, um, before we make any you know, specific decisions on these projects. Um, uh, the one thing I would say is, I think we are gonna need to, I mean, it's clear that, that, uh, that we're at significant risk that TOT revenue is gonna come in low and it may or may not be uh, uh, compensated for by increases in, uh, over budget of uh, in, uh, in sales taxes. And some of our assumptions had to do with, uh, you know, rising sales taxes rates in order to fund services over the next few years too. So um, I think what we need to do is we need to see a picture on what the capital plan is gonna look like over the next five years. And I think we need to see that within the time frame that we need to make a decision on the public safety building because uh, it's such a big piece of it. And so, if we need to make a decision on the public safety building by, for example, the end of the year, uh, then I think it's important we have some of the, the full capital plan scenarios by that time, uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, the regular uh, budget cycle. That's all. I think, you know, we, we got to start looking at this. Um, but again, I don't, I don't think we should. I don't think we should make any you know, sort of decisions like that this evening. Um, we just don't know. Yet. Okay, thanks. Okay, Councilmember Cormack. 
I completely um, concur with council member Phil says comments. Um, yes, we need scenarios on the um, infrastructure plan. And I, you know, I'll just note that I'm pretty sure that the police building isn't agendized this evening in any way that would make it appropriate for us to, you know, make a decision <laughs> anyway. Okay. Um, so we've talked about attrition. We have three other topics. Um, I just want to go to the council reserve that we set up because there were four categories. So one of the what we've dealt with the uh, public safety, which was one of the categories. Um, the next was community services. So, um, you know, I remember speaking about how, you know, we could tell already that parks and open spaces were important. Um, and we've seen this happening with, um, you know, the um, demand at Foothills Park on the weekend, really approaching the limit and, perha and perhaps needing another ranger. We've seen um, the need to additionally staff ma at Magical Bridge in order to be able to open it safely, um, given the, the amazing resource that it is. Um, you know, at the risk of um, sort of going down the, uh, the path that uh, the vice mayor started, I wonder if Director O'Kane, if there were one or two things that you felt we should add back now in community services, what would those be? And what would the dollars look like? Hmm. Um, thank you for that question. It is a, a really good question. And it's actually pretty difficult to answer because um, right now what we're offering is a, still a lot of virtual programming and classes. And um, we've actually expanded a lot of our classes and programming to outdoors. So we're providing both adults and children's classes and sports programs outdoors, how we can um, how we can do that. So, um, I think part of that is really dependent on where we go from here with respect to the public health order um, and what our restrictions are in that. And and I'm trying to do some really quick thinking here. Um, I would. My preference, I think, would be to maybe have that question asked again in a couple months um, and see where, where we might be able to add some things in based on our, our health order. Um, okay. Our staff are working. Um, the staff that we have are working. They're um, being super creative and doing a lot of virtual special events even, um, you know, just to keep the community engaged. Um, I'm not sure with the health order restrictions right now that there's more that we could provide. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, and then my next question would be for Mr. Cami, probably. Um, with the middle schools and high schools looking to start in um, January in some form, um, one of the other things we talked about with this when we eliminated the shuttle service entirely is, you know, we might need to add something back. Um, what are your thoughts about starting in January, what we might need to do with our shuttle service? Thank you. <clears throat> Can you hear me or see me? Yes, both. Okay, great. Sorry, I had to switch to my cell phone because I was getting very spotty Wi-Fi service. Um, the, uh, the shuttle service, um, the, the contract that we had um, was terminated. However, um, we spoke with legal and if, you know, we desired to, you know, reinstate service, there's an option for us to revisit that contract um, that we had with our previous provider. Um, just noting that, you know, typically most public transit providers um, in the area are doing uh, slightly reduced um, capacity in their shuttles. Um, however, we did talk with our vendor um, the vendor that was providing service in Palo Alto. And they actually, instead of um, decreasing the capacity in their shuttles, what they've done is they've switched to larger shuttles in order to um, continue using capacity. So um, that is always a possibility. Um, I don't know if um, January would be uh, a reasonable uh, amount of time to get it started up. Um, I'm not saying that it's um, impossible, um, but if that's something that council desires, that's something that we would have to look into. Okay, well, I think it's important for us to work with the school district and figure out what the needs might be there and be prepared to support them at the time that it comes. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I guess one other area would be under the COVID response area. Um, and we have certainly, ha we can see just picking up on what the school district is doing, the work they're doing on indoor air quality and testing for employees. Um, is that something I'll ask staff that um, we should be contemplating doing and potentially needing to use some of these funds for? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, we have been actively involved, as you know, on the testing front, on the indoor air quality that has been an ongoing review, and I'll ask Director Eggleston uh, to comment. I think one of the questions uh, that um, we would want to uh, reflect on is really strategically, where would we place our emphasis there? So if, for example, we saw gatherings, i.e. a council meeting or a venue for council meetings as a key um, uh, type of indoor use that we'd be uh, wanting to design around, then the selection of which, which facilities would be most suitable, recognizing the, the balance of the uh, uh, capacity with the functionality and the cost associated with any upgrades. Um, is one of those factors that we've been we've been discussing, as well as access and everything else involved with running a facility um, that might be available to the public, or if it were simply for employee use, another scenario, as well as uh, the use of portable uh, equipment. So, with that, Mr. Eggleston, any particular um, angles on this you'd like to share? Well, I'll just add to that to say slightly that yeah, we we've, we've had some ongoing work in place uh, with our facilities group. Uh, looking at different city facilities and the types of H HVAC systems that they have, um, comparing to best practices that are uh, suggested in guidelines by the CDC and ASHRAE, which is the uh, Society for Refrigeration and Heating and Air Conditioning. So some of those have to do with things like um, using the um, highest uh, type of uh, filter that you can place in the system based on how it's designed. Uh, things like uh, maximizing the outdoor air airflow, um, you know, not shutting the system down during hours when there are fewer people in the buildings, which are things that we, we uh, typically do for energy efficiency reasons. So all those uh, sorts of things are things that we can look at and try to maximize within uh, what we have, but there definitely are uh, limitations. And uh, so, as Ed mentioned, you know, we're also looking at uh, developing so, uh, some uh, costs for what it would take to uh, potentially retrofit existing systems. And the information we have on that preliminarily is that that would be very expensive. Uh, so also looking for some recommendations on things we might do with portable equipment that could supplement systems uh, in places where it would be appropriate. Okay, well, um, if anyone's keeping track, I, I vote that we do the libraries before we do City Hall. Pretty sure that that's what most people would want. <laughs> um, thanks for that. Um, I must be at my five minutes. I'm looking to see. Yep, yes. there. She, okay, great. All right. Um, and we still haven't gotten to uh, Coverly tenants or recovery. All right. Thanks. Probably several other items. Uh, Councilmember Tanaka. Can staff uh, bring up slide number seven? Um, so on slide seven, uh, as Kylie brings it up, uh, I noticed there are kind of like three uh, down red arrows, which um, indicate that it's being uh, less than projected. Um, and all of them have kind of associated fairly do large dollar figures and then only two up arrows uh, in terms of it's, it's trending more, although I'm, I'm very skeptical about the sales tax, just given the retailers that I'm talking to right now. So I guess I, I, I'm trying to understand why, why would we not try to make some corrective action now? We, we see that, um, you know, that some of our projections are maybe not as good as we were hoping. Um, why not start making small adjustments now versus having to make a major correction later? Um, what, what is the, the rationale behind that? Um, from a financial and a data perspective, um, I think part of it is, is uh, not wanting to um, overreact. Uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way, for lack of a better term. I guess I mean it in the sense that we only have so much data. So as you, uh, how can I explain it? For example, as uh, Director O'Kane 
just said, we continue to adapt our services as the health orders change, as staff come up with new ways to deliver the services. And so for us to make adjustments now, um, I think we have a lot of months left in the year and things could continue to change. So when you're looking at something like charges for services and licenses and permits, those are things like the services that Director O'Kane and Director Lee are talking about. Um, and right now, this is only reflective of data through August at best. Um, in some instances, it's only data through July. Um, and so as we continue to evolve and adapt, um, you know, these estimates may change um, as, as we're going through. I would also add, uh, Council Member, I'd be curious what you have in mind with respect to small changes. Um, I think our experience is that w given the, the types of issues that we're talking about, that there are no small changes that uh, would likely be independent of uh, creating issues in other parts of the city. So you know, on that basis, when, as we have, uh, the city undertakes a, a, a process of cutting, cutting, cutting budgets, cutting spending, that those are pretty significant undertakings. So we would like to ensure that as we're doing it, we have an eye on what is the target and uh, that it will take a, a pretty significant level of effort. Well, I mean, if I, I realize, you know, we um, could also use more data, right? But we have some data now. And, you know, if I just look at the superficial level of this, it, it looks like we might be a little bit short here, but of course, you know, understand that once all the numbers come in, we'll, we'll know for sure. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm reading, reading about like how a lot of companies are running out PPP money. There's a, a second round of layoffs. You know, it's uh, some of the companies that have been trying to hold on to people really can't hold on any longer. You know, massive drop in GDP, unemployment, all this kind of stuff. So it just seems like we should start preparing for a scenario that's not looking as as rosy as we were hoping. So it just seems like, um, you know, we should start laying down some plans for how would we, um, you know, we, we, see, we, see, we see the direction of where things are headed. It seems like we would try to start thinking about how do we make adjustments. I'm not necessarily saying that we got to slash, slash everything right now, but we, I think we should start thinking about it because, um, uh, I mean, this is what we know so far and it, it, it's looking a little bit scary. Um, okay, um, but anyways, let's go on to the other items on here. So uh, we do have that 744,000. Um, you know, I've heard from quite a few business owners about just needing some relief. Um, and we saw that, I guess it looks like a lot of people are becoming delinquent on their utility bills as well. Um, so uh, I'd love to hear my colleagues thought, but to me, it seems like we should start thinking about some rental relief uh, utility bill relief. I think it, sound, it seems like a pretty good use of our uh, COVID council, our COVID nineteen council reserve. Um, so I would love to hear my colleagues' thoughts on that. But um, that's kind of where I'm leaning right now, just in terms of trying to be the helping hand uh, to the community right now. Uh, it seems like a lot of people need this, both on the residential and commercial side. Um, but the other part here, and I, I don't know if other people have thoughts on this, but when I look at this, it just it just seems like we should start making some corrections. I mean, we don't have to make anything drastic, but we should start thinking about it and maybe give staff some direction on on um, where things are going to go because it doesn't look like it's headed exactly where we want it right now. Five minutes. Okay, uh, Council Member Koo. Um, I wanted to ask on the ventilation uh, system <clears throat> air purifiers and so forth, that would be, um, is, there a, is there a quick plan in order to implement that? I mean, I heard um, Mr. Eggleston say that it's pretty expensive. Um, do you know how expensive, I mean, could you give me an idea of how expensive that is? Well, um... If the idea of, uh, for instance, was to retrofit an existing significant size building with, with HEPA filters in, in the primary um, HVAC system, much of the system could have to be rebuilt potentially. Oh. Uh, so we do plan to look at that, but it, the, those numbers are, are likely to be 
very expensive uh, versus other types of ideas such as um, placing portable HEPA filtration units in uh, particular uh, spaces where people are located. Or even these ideas uh, that we've looked at of these um, bipolar ionization units that can cause uh, particles uh, in the air to, to clump together and be better filtered by uh, even existing HVAC systems. Um, so when you, maybe that's something that you can bring back um, when you guys return so that we can have a better idea of what it is going to be. And if you could also explore this with Palo Alto Unified School District, maybe that's um, uh, something that we can learn from them because they also have substantial buildings that they're um, doing the air filtra filtration for. Um, and I think they've implemented that already because they had that plan. And at the city schools liaison committee meeting, they did mention that and they've offered um, to actually collaborate. So um, that would be, um, it'll be great to hear back from you when you return. Did you have something to say, Ed? Yeah, I was just going to note that, again, just maybe stating the obvious here, but our uh, current work mode is, you know, perhaps, again, hate to say it, this is obvious, but we're not in the business of classrooms. And so our um, uh, focus is re has been around the remote work for those who would be in a more traditional office uh, environment versus uh, other um, areas of our operation, whether it be public safety or uh, utilities, which are again, field operations. So the applicability um, for any specific uh, facility is uh, a little different uh, than it would be for the school district. Uh, and so on that basis, uh, we've been talking about a focus on whether it's gathering spaces. So uh, Councilmember Cormack mentioned libraries. And again, we are currently not providing in library services. Those are sidewalk services. So that um, at least in the near term is the focus. But then as the weather turns, then looking at whether it be Mitchell Park, library, community center as possible locations for assembly use that might be um, um, worthwhile. Those are definitely scenarios to explore. We also need to make the policy decision if actually having in-person assembly functions is something that we want to plan for. So there, again, my point is simply that there are multiple variables here that, uh, again, as we set our priorities for uh, where the council would like us to focus the indoor activities, uh, then that will help us uh, in our next steps. Okay, so I mean, that, that is something, you know, especially for public gatherings and so forth. Um, for example, if we had another bad air day and you needed one of these buildings in order for people to go to, uh, in order to get out of the bad air, or if there's no power because of rolling blackouts and so forth, I think, you know, I, I wanna make sure that we are planning for that and we have something that would allow the, the capacity that we're allowed now. Um, yes, and in fact, just to cover that base, that is exactly why we have been using Mitchell Park, which has the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Brad, MRF, MRF 13? MRF 13, yes. Uh, level of filtration, which was uh, uh, appropriate uh, for that use, um, although it doesn't have the same level of filtration as the, as the HEPA. Okay, and I want to make sure also that you're not, so Mitchell is at the southern part of Palo Alto. I mean, I, I want us also to start considering the northern part, then not everybody's traveling to one end of town. Um, the other thing I wanted to find out is, you know, with firefighters um, and police also, is there overtime that has been accumulated or that has happened? Because yeah, of the lesser, lesser staff, you know, Left lesser staffing? Yes. To what percentage and degree are we? Right, I'm not sure I would classify the overtime specifically as a cause from, due to the, uh, or result as a, due to the cause of less staffing. Uh, I definitely think overtime is up in these departments, but that's for other circumstances. Um, as council member Nis discussed the wildfires. Uh, there's a significant amount of overtime that comes through those activities or staffing station eight. 
um, due to high fire danger days. Um, for those times when we're going out on strike teams, that is reimbursed. Uh, so those costs will have a revenue offset later on. Um, on the police side, I do think that they had um, increased overtime, especially over the summer month months to help support the, the peaceful uh, gatherings that were occurring um, to make sure that road closures were happening, et cetera. Um, in, in, um, in light of the Black, Black Lives Matter and the race and equity work. Um, so absolutely, I think overtime is up. I'm not sure that it, I would necessarily peg it to a uh, direct cause of the reductions. That's okay. five minutes. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm gonna take five minutes here. So I'm supportive of extending the fire positions. I think we should um, understand what cost neutral there would look like. Um, in general, I would have liked to see more charts that show where we are currently and where we are forecasting now versus where we thought we were when we did the budget. Um, I really like to see cash flow versus our income projections. Um, what was clear from the staff report is there's a lot of variability. And uh, I really think we need to reserve, we need to maintain the COVID reserve. I think staff did a great job of forecasting without a lot of information. And I think we still have a lot of open questions and I took staff's recommendation as don't spend the COVID reserve now, but we should wait and I'm gonna support that tonight. Um, you know, in the September 14th meeting, we, we asked for more stuff. We had rapid COVID testing, we had childcare, which was gonna have potentially funding needs. Um, and I do think you're starting to hear and you're talking about a plan for reopening. And, you know, I think seeing the San Jose and San Francisco plans was really useful to me. That was one of the most useful parts of the report. And I really think we need to get moving on our own proactive recovery plans, even anticipating a vaccine. You know, what does this look like? Um, you know, when we, when we made the budget, we said it was gonna be pretty dynamic. And now is the time I think we need to really start looking at changes, um, not treating this like a typical budget. So I think we should be asking, how do we reopen safely? How do we ensure a good recovery? Um, how do we help our businesses survive? And, and what's the plan for the new normal? And I think a lot of the questions that Councilmember Ku was getting to about MERV 13 filters, again, the way I was interpreting that was, what's it gonna take to start to get some people coming back to City Hall, employees working in the building? Um, I do think the school district found some MERV 13 filters that would retrofit into existing air conditioning systems and maybe uh, you know, Mr. Eggleston can talk, talk to them. I know there's this concern that it won't work and won't retrofit, but apparently they found a way to do that. There was also some uh, other technologies they're using to ionize the air and things. Um, I think the more we can do there, that's actually, I would rather fund that and help our private businesses learn to improve their air quality and protect against viruses. Uh, to me, I think that's a huge health benefit across the board. And, you know, having cleaner air will help with the smoke. There could be, you know, flu in the future. It's, it's just not COVID-19 and we're done. So I, I think it's a worthwhile investment. Um, we haven't really talked about Foothills Fire. You know, with all these mega fires, I, I am getting more concerned about that. I typically haven't been pushing for that, but I do think as we look at the budget, we need to look at um, potentially how, how are we going to fund that? We're sending our crews all over the place. What if we need them here? How are we going to sustain that? Or do we have the budget budget for that? Um, and then we're talking about potentially public safety reforms with mental health clinicians, social service providers. So I see a lot of budget needs and not a lot of funds right now. Um, and quickly, I think the last thing and, and so overall, again, I, I, I support the, the motion to extend those fire positions, but I, you know, I don't think we should be spending a lot more money tonight. I do think the question about rent on city properties is an interesting one. I think we should consider some form of either uh, rent deferral, um, uh, Sistan suggested some percentage rent based on, on business no, we don't want to administer something very complicated, but I think we also need to look at um, 
if people go out of business, who are going to rent these spaces to, you know, and is it better to get some partial payments and keep buildings occupied? Um, and so I think similar to, to other landlords, we should be, we should be having that mindset. And the, the tricky thing is we also have a lot of nonprofits um, and what do we do for them? So I don't, I don't have answers, but I am concerned and I don't think we should just continue. I think staff asked for some feedback from council. So, so my feedback there is that we need to find a way to work with people renting our, our buildings really with this mindset of if they go out of business and it's empty, we're gonna be worse off than you know, getting some partial rent and maybe some deferred rent. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. I do wanna point out, you know, we are at, at 1013. You know, generally we say we do a time check at 1030. Um, I think, you know, possibly what we should do is, I think we should definitely finish this item. And I think we've all been concerned about the budget and it's taken a while to get to us. Um, I'm gonna suggest that maybe we take public comment on the boards and commissions item, and then we continue that item. Would, would that make sense, Mr. City Manager? Sure, that would be fine. I, I don't believe we've got anything time sensitive on the boards and commissions uh, item. Yeah, I do see a bunch of people have been patiently waiting. So. so why don't we see if we can finish up this budget item, and then we would go to public comment on boards and commissions and then uh, stop there. So I see uh, a bunch of hands. Um, so council member Felsith. Yeah, just briefly, um, I, I concur with the vice mayor that uh, uh, I think uh, not, not, not to direct any specific action tonight uh, on any property, but uh, I think staff should go look at sort of our role as a landlord to some of the small businesses in town and, you know, see if see if we can see if we should work the way some of the some of the private landlords have been doing too. I think that applies to us as well. Um, and Councilmember Philsa, uh, if I might take while you have your five minutes, uh, yeah. we have information on sales tax. Oh, uh, thank you. Yes, yes. The shopping district. Um, yeah. Thank you, Thomas and Fran, for your help on that. Uh, again, with the caveat that these are difficult numbers to to see your stomach, especially given the. Uh, fluctuations in timing. Um, Q2 2020 was um, 70, down 77% um, quarter over quarter. So if I looked at the second quarter of 2020 versus the second quarter of 2019, um, right. the shopping center region was down uh, about 77%. And, and how far down were restaurants? You were going to ask me that. I have it. Restaurants were down quarter over quarter about 53%. So the shopping center was down more than the restaurants. Now, remember there's timing differences. So part of it could be just that of some of, of the restaurants and, and retailers in the shopping center chose not to file um, and, or have deferments. That one seems interesting to me because my sense is a lot of the shopping center business comes from visitors to Palo Alto coming here from out of town. And so as we watch that one, that's going to be an indicator of how fast are people coming back to town, right? As opposed to cocooning where they are. So, all right, thanks. Thank you. Sorry, trying to deal with the pet. Uh, Council Member Tanaka. Uh, I wanted to ask the city manager, I mean, there's at least a few of us who are interested in um, seeing what we could do as landlords for the small businesses in the city. Um, what specific direction do you need from us, if anything, to kind of move forward on that? Because that's a question you brought up. So what, what do you think, what should we do here? Yeah, um, thank you, Council Member, for the question. Uh, as we've been talking about the, the one, one question is, to a certain extent, the, how much money you want to put to that specific purpose. And that's a... a a very big question. And on the basis of, hypothetically, if you had identified a given dollar amount that we would be able to identify how far it could go, we might suggest uh, potentially a window of time, the question of for-profit versus non-profit, that may be a distinction that the council wants to make. Um, uh, 
uh, organizations that were able to operate during shelter in place versus those that were not and, and perhaps still aren't. Uh, there was a, a reference uh, from our uh, form fitness uh, representative on a percentage going forward. So, you know, there are a variety of uh, forms that staff could take back and then come back to you with uh, some recommendations on how to structure uh, a relief uh, package. Um, and, and again, to a certain extent, it depends on how big a package the council might want to consider. I don't know if we will know that tonight because there's a lot of kind of unknowns. But is this something that you guys can do and then bring come back to us, or is there something that we have to have as specific to the current motion? I think we tonight we're getting a sense that the council is interested in putting something together. So, so based on uh, the feedback, I think uh, with uh, Director Nose and, and team, we sh which we should be able to come back to you with uh, some options. Okay, so it doesn't need to be part of the motion then. That, that's fine. Um, and then the the second question is. Um, so it's great that we're helping out our neighboring communities uh, with the fire. Uh, and I, I think I recall that the city gets fully reimbursed by the, by the other cities or the state. Is that right? To, uh, FEMA reimbursement as a FEMA, Okay. Yeah. So, so, and that's hundred percent, including the overtime that is incurred. Uh, that's overtime and backfill. Okay. So, so everything. So I guess, um, I guess, uh, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, but I think um, some of the, several other council members asked about, you know, how do we make this thing cost neutral? Um, is, uh, actually, can someone bring the motion back up? Um, because I, I, I don't think we wanna, um, I, I do think we wanna try to make this cost neutral. So the, I think this was brought up and we kind of um, sidebarred it for a bit, but how do we make progress on, on that question? Because I, I'm also interested in that topic and it seems like other council members, uh, I think we all kind of want this, but it's kind of like, how do we make a pencil out? So how, I don't know if, if um, um, Director Nose, you've, you've had a chance to think about it a little bit and maybe make a recommendation as how does that happen? Because I think I've heard it from several people who, who asked about that. I think in general, staff has heard the, the council's desires and wish. So to your, to your point and similar to the rent question, we understand uh, from a motion perspective, the identification of cost neutral, um, perhaps a way that the council, if they so chose to adjust this would be um, directing staff to look towards identifying cost neutral options first. Um, and, but ultimately with the backstop that council would be dedicating that partial part of the $744,000 reserve towards this effort if we were unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess part of the question is, is, is that the will of the council that you would want to direct some of that 744 towards this effort? Well, I guess I would ask the maker and seconder of the motion, um, what, what are you guys' thoughts on that in terms of, uh, it seems like this is a need and the question, the hard question of course, is how do we fund it? So I don't know if the maker or seconder have, has a thought about, about that. I think you're muted, Liz. What what are you what are you thinking of adding to this, Greg? Uh, just basically what Director Nose just said. <laughs> uh, uh, it would be direct, motion. May I? May I? As a seconder, direct staff to start by identifying cost neutral options, and um, in the event that is not sufficient. Um, utilize the council reserve, COVID council reserve. Mm -hmm. That's, does yeah. that work, Director Nose? Yep. And Council Member Tanaka, does that capture your request? Yeah, I mean, I think it's not just my because I've, I've heard it from okay. several of you. And so. Council Member Niss, all good with you? Fine with me. Great. Okay. It's five minutes. Employ okay. the better. Okay, thank you. Great, do you have any any small thing you want to continue with or something? Um, well, it's, um, you know, so I, I, I thought what you said earlier in terms of, um, I mean, we were kind of saying similar things in terms of, uh, you know, we look at the numbers and, you know, we, we um, I, I guess we, we have some early indication where things are headed and maybe not enough detail or graphs for us to really kind of sink our teeth into, but, um, to me, it's a little bit dangerous to treat this like a regular budget cycle where we could pretty much count on the revenue 
coming in, so we don't have to worry so much. But this seems like we have to be much be much more dynamic this year, in terms of uh, making sure that uh, the budget works because there's so much uncertainty going on. And so I, I was just trying to think about kind of some things you said, uh, and and thinking about how do we help staff in terms of um, in terms of uh, uh, like you mentioned some things about graphs or. Maybe, you know, maybe the CMANAGER also has some stuff in here about financial modeling and forecasting. I don't know whether CMANAGER, you, you feel like you need some sort of direction or part of this motion to kind of give you the, uh, the support you need to kind of do that. But I, 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 don't, I don't think, and I don't think it's just the vice mayor myself who is thinking that I think several other council members kind of mentioned something similar and you, and you have it on your recommendation here, but I don't quite know what the, I mean, I would actually love to get for you guys to do the sampling, but it sounds like that's logistically too hard for you guys. But I'm just trying to think of how do we rationalize this budget in time of incredible uncertainty so that we can land nicely by the end of this budget cycle. We are looking at some options. So we're not prepared tonight to be able to tell you that we've got a, a strategy to uh, give you greater confidence in what those scenarios ought to be. Uh, but uh, we, we should be able to come back to you fairly shortly with what options we can identify. Okay, so there's nothing that you need in terms of like four, item four on the uh, thing to, to, um, to allow you to do better modeling or projections to kind of make some corrections earlier than, than later on the budget. Um, I think we're, we're already on that path, so no specific direction needed. I have definitely heard loud and clear the desire to get uh, more timely uh, information and, and reduce the lead time necessary to, to bring that back to you. Yeah, and I think the other part is making the ability to make course corrections earlier, because in the past, the budgets really didn't have to change that much because you know the numbers are pretty solid, but we, we're, this year is very different, right? And the numbers are, are very... <laughs> For sure, yeah. Very not solid, right? So it's, it's just kind of like, how do we, how do we, um, you know, yeah, I, I think it seems like you know what to do. So um, okay. that's all I had right now. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Councilmember Nista, do you want to speak again? Let, let me just do it quickly because I, I think, I think we really have, we, we've really pulled a lot out of this report tonight. Um, we haven't really discussed what advantage there would be in looking at other cities and their plans to recover. So I, I hope that we'll get to do that another time. I think, Vice Mayor, your idea that we go to listening to the public is, is wise. Um, but I, I don't want us to forget that talking with others, and um, I've been talking with the ones I've been talking with at Cities Association, I imagine, Ed, you're talking with the city managers at the city managers organization. So there's a lot to pull from other areas and um, I hope we don't forget to do that. That's it. All right, Council Member Cormack. Thank you, Vice Mayor Du Bois. Um, just with respect to how we treat our tenants, um, I'd like us to, you know, recall how we treated our employees at the end of last fiscal year um, when we were as generous as we could be um, for, a, for a defined period of time. Um, and I feel like that might be a model that we could use um, with our tenants as well. Um, so I am supportive of having a uh, relief package for our tenants, but I think it would need to be time bounded um, and um, I look forward to staff bringing that back. I'm glad we don't need to put that in a motion. Um, but I do think that's important. That's a, a responsibility and a role that we have um, as a landlord. Um, with respect to the recovery plan, I'm just shifting gears to that for a moment. So um, in the Silicon Valley one, which was the first attachment, I think on page 12, um, there are two things that I wanna call everyone's attention to and would love staff to to really spend some time on. And the first is item four, reimagining the neighborhood districts. And the second is item six, expanding digital inclusion. I'm mostly focused on better connectivity. Um, if we think about fiber to the home and the other things that might now, we might have a business case that is completely different than what we would have imagined last year. So those I think are things that um, are really worth doing. Um, and I'll just spell out what uh, item four says for anyone following along at home who can't get through all of these pages. Uh, rethink how important commercial work, 
work and community spaces are built, structured and connected. Um, so that's an opportunity I think we have. Um, and then I also think on the next page, on page 14, it talks about reskilling. That's something we haven't talked about in terms of our own workforce, nor in terms of what we might be um, providing in classes um, for um, people who live here, but uh, we are in a transformation and the kinds of work that people do and how they do it um, is changing. Um, so those are things that jump out to me in terms of what was provided. Um, uh, another topic I'd like us to weave through and include as we go through the recovery is thinking about sustainability as part of any redesign that we do. Um, this is gonna be a great time to just sort of blend those two things together because in addition to everything else this summer, you know, we've had such um, visible reminders of climate change and its impact on our community. Um, and then the final thing is I hope we can uh, find room for a little bit of fun in the recovery and to the uh, council member Nissa's point about working with other communities. Um, I was speaking with some friends over the weekend who um, had ideas about what, when we're al allowed to reopen, um, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful to have something on University Avenue that starts in East Palo Alto, comes through Palo Alto and goes all the way to Stanford when school is reopened, you know, when people are able to um, gather in some function, uh, some form. Um, sounds like we could have a concert. Um, one of the, uh, the person's ideas, we could get an autonomous vehicle to drive in front, et cetera. So in addition to all of the serious work that I know needs to be done, um, let's, let's try to keep in mind the, the perspective of, you know, what's, what could be great um, as we start back out. Um, let me just make sure there wasn't anything else on the list to go through. That's all I have. Okay, I'm gonna try to wrap this item up. Uh, Council Member Ku, did you have some last thoughts? Last thoughts, I was wondering if um, for this motion that you have over here, if you'd consider before going and using the COVID-19 reserve fund that we also explore if um, the Fire um, Pre Prevention Bureau could, re could return back to the fire department and what kind of cost we could um, save over there that could be allocated towards the three um, firefighter positions. If that might be something that could be explored and brought back um, for council to consider or to understand how that would work out. Um, I'm not sure what council member Nissa's understanding was of the answer to your question, but I, I, I don't feel that I understood that that would be helpful from a budgetary standpoint. And if staff can just help let me, me ask, out. Let me ask a question. Yeah. So does staff under the council neutral part of this, they're gonna explore any and all options first? That's correct. Okay, so if that one made sense, you would consider it? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I just want to remind that, you know, oh, go ahead, Jill. Oh, I just wanted to give you a, a little bit of background. I know you had talked about the uh, SB 1205 um, mandated, state mandated inspections. And um, <clears throat> so a little bit of history is that this uh, Senate bill was post uh, the ghost ship fire that was in Oakland and realizing that there were some essential occupancies that should be inspected on an annual basis. And that includes schools, residential uh, high rises, multi-unit residential complexes, hotels, motels, apartments, and daycares. Um, in Palo Alto, there's approximately uh, roughly 600. And um, I don't know the exact number, but um, I do know that we do not charge for most of those inspections. There are no fees for those. So those are state mandated uh, per health and safety. And because um, <clears throat> I inquired about that when we talked about this early on before budget adoption. And, um, and I was advised that we do not collect money on most of those uh, inspections. So again, where I don't know how we would be able to do the uh, reallocation of money from uh, development services into the fire suppression salaries, um, I don't think there's a significant amount enough money to um, uh, revenue to accrue through those state mandated inspections. And I can get more details on those, but my understanding is that there isn't a significant amount of uh, revenue on doing those inspections. Okay, so it's not just those inspections. I, I'm, that's one part of it. 
but I want I want to actually have understanding and exploring returning the fire the fire um, in, uh, prevention bureau back to the fire department and then you know under your um, department how to utilize them better so that it can actually generate more revenue if there's a way to generate revenue, whether it is through the planning department going out on inspections and so forth. But I'd like to understand that better and if that might be able to support um, partially or fully um, the three firefighters uh, retaining them. Uh, after all, each of them, when we put them through the training, it's about 200,000 for each of them. So certainly we, after all that investment, we wanna do everything that we can in order to keep them in our department. So if I, we could explore that option as well in, 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 uh, through this directive, that would be great. Um, that would be one. And I don't remember my other one, so that's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lydia. Yeah. Um, just super quick. Again, it sounds like we are providing some direction to staff and not necessarily putting it all in motions. I think what I heard earlier is that we really want an update on the capital plan with some scenarios, certainly before final decision on the public safety building, I think really on before any major capital spend. So hopefully that will come to us pretty quickly. Um, the staff, staff heard that. Yes. Um, and then you're gonna bring back a plan maybe on city rentals with some options. And then the third one, again, I really think we need to start thinking about recovery plans and retrofitting buildings. And even if the costs may appear substantial, I think we should see what those are gonna look like. That again, we may wanna shift some capital improvements into those things, they may, they may be worth it. Um, <clears throat> so I think we're getting ready to vote on this motion. Uh, Council Member Tanaka, I see your hand up again. Do you have any any final comment? Yeah, it's really quick. Uh, so first of all, I, I like uh, 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 Council Member Cormack's idea about the uh, fiber. I mean, I think that's, I've heard this from so many people about internet not, not fast enough, including my own family. So definitely, uh, definitely a big need from work from home. Um, and I'd like to staff how you guys put in the, the, the two uh, reports um, in terms of um, you know, the kind of task force that people put together. I, it was actually very, very helpful. In fact, it makes me think about, so many years ago, um, when I was under the Infrastructure Blue Ribbon Commission, we had a uh, challenge in how do we fund our infrastructure? And I, I think several of us have mentioned this before, but I, I wonder whether it makes sense for us to do some sort of temporary, like recovery commission or something, something, what, something like what San Francisco did or other cities are doing to try to figure out how to get their city um, back on track. But, um, Anyway, this is probably a larger discussion than we have time for tonight, but um, I just want to thank staff for uh, putting in those um, example reports because actually I found them very useful and had really good ideas in them. So thank you for that. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and vote on this motion. Um, and actually, Council Member Tanaka, you're first up. Yes. Council Member Cormack? Yes. I vote yes. Council Member Filseth? Yes. Council Member Niss? Yes. And Council Member Koo? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I know that one took a lot of time. I think I think it was important. It's been quite a while since we looked at the budget. It's important. <laughs> yep. So um, I imagine people may want to take a break. Um, How about five minutes? Let's do a five minute break and then we'll come back and we'll hear from the public and then we'll go to council member comments. So we'll see you guys at uh, 1040. Got it.
<clears throat> if you're back, if you could put your camera on. All right, looks like we have a <clears throat> quorum. So we're gonna move on to item number nine, which is consideration of recommendations by the city council ad hoc on boards, commissions, and committees. Um, given the time, I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna to go to public comment and then we're gonna continue this item. And um, city manager, do we know when we would continue this item too? Or maybe yeah, it's not. Back. Um, yeah, it is not quite back yet. Um, and I Monique, can I speak? This is Beth. Yep, go ahead, Beth. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Mayor Du Bois. Um, if we um, start next week's meeting at five o'clock instead of six, we could accommodate putting this item on next week. Okay. So we'll we'll continue it maybe to a date uncertain, but it sounds like it'll be pretty. Certain will be next week. Just maybe let the city manager review that. Okay, so uh, is city clerk, should we should we go to the public and these people have been waiting patiently all night? Sure. Any member of the public that wishes to speak on this item, the consideration of recommendations on the board and commissions, please raise your hand. At this time, We'll take David Moss to be followed by Patty Rieger. David, go I, ahead, you have two minutes. Hi there, I'm David Moss. I'm a current Parks and Rec Commissioner. And I wanna point out before you reduce the number of commissioners that we have not one, not two, not three, but eight different projects, issues, policies, and processes that we are working on currently, including Foothills Park and Coverly, and the steady stream of park improvement ordinances and park and facility use policies, especially during this, uh, this uh, COVID crisis. Um, and besides that, we have 10 different liaison positions monitoring everything from school district city use of, of uh, shared parks uh, to safe routes, to sustainability, to uh, climate change and tide uh, issues to urban forestry, to the Fry's pro property, to community gardens and aquatics and golf. All of these things require uh, a tremendous amount of time for the commissioners. And to reduce that, we'll probably double our load. And we, you can ask any uh, CSD staff member if we, uh, we don't get any salary if we are saving them a lot of work up front before they deal with a lot of these issues and they're all contentious and they all have uh, issues that we save them a lot of time in this very difficult budgetary uh, period, which you covered extensively in, this, in the last agenda item. So, think carefully before you reduce the number of commissioners. Thank you. Thank you, David Moss. Our next speaker is Patty Rieger to be followed by Lynn Chiapella. Hi, I'm Patty Rieger and I'm speaking on, on my own. I'm a human relations commission and I, I completely understand what David Moss is speaking about, about the load. We are now five and we have a tremendous load that's one issue I really recommend that the council reconsiders their decision about reducing this recreation for three reasons. One is diversity, not only racial, but it's also political. Um, we have had on Human Relations Commission, we have other political parties and that added a tremendous aspect to our conversation and our decision-making um, racially and economically. I think when you start 
reducing the staff, I mean, a committee to five, it puts not only a burden on the, on the committee, but it also lacks diversity. The second issue that I would like to talk about is the issue of, I think it's great that you have an ability to remove a city commissioner or a board member, but I think that it shouldn't be as it's written, rescinds the right to remove one or more members at any time for any reason. I think that is just a horrible, horrible way to manage someone and, and especially to ask them to volunteer. Then the third one is, is about being able to speak to the press. That is our first amendment right. And, and as Ed was noted earlier, is that you're having a hard time finding people that wanna serve these boards. So you need to look what your legacy is of what you want these commissions and boards to do when you're limiting our right to speak, when you're limiting our ability to, to work together by diversity, and when you're limiting our a way of working together when we think that we could be removed for any reason at any time. And I hope that you, re, you think about this since we're not gonna be working on this till next week, about your legacy of what you want the city and the commissions to represent the community and what you want us to work on. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Our next speaker is Lynn Chiapella to be followed by Larry Magan. Lynn, go ahead. Lynn, go ahead, you have two minutes. Lynn, are you able to speak? We'll come back to Lynn. Our next speaker is Larry Maggot to be followed by Lynn Chiapella. Larry, you may have to unmute from your end. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. A few years ago, the editor of one of our local papers asked me if I'd like to wrote, write a political column, but I declined at the time because I thought that the differences between the mostly progressive local officials was so nuanced that it wasn't worth writing about uh, local politics. But based on what I'm seeing from this council, I'm tempted to reconsider. What I'm seeing tonight is not nuanced. It's a direct attack on the First Amendment and the right of citizen commission members. Full disclosure, I'm the husband of HRC Commissioner Patty Regeer, who I've observed working so hard over the past year to enhance the quality of life in our community, sometimes with headwinds from staff and members of council. I have never been a local commissioner, but I did serve on a congressionally mandated commission during the Obama administration. In my role as a federal commissioner, I was free to express my own views, and the only role of staff was to support the commission, not to constantly tell us what we couldn't do. Palo Alto commissioners and board members deserve the same respect. The proposed handbook's clause to discourage commissioners from speaking to the press is not only anti-democratic, but the mere conversation about it is a distraction and a waste of time during a period when the city should be focusing on the pandemic and the economic crisis. Why on earth would anyone go out of their way to propose a provocative and downright silly plan? It shows a lack of seriousness or worse, a petty obsession or fear of public disclosure and discourse. Of course, board members should make it clear that they speak for themselves, but they should never be stifled. I also think that we need to respect the fact that board members and commissioners are citizens who are expressing themselves and who are appointed because of their expertise. They should be encouraged to express themselves and they should never be removed except for cause if they do something which clearly violates the law ethics or some other situation after due count, after due hearing. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Did we lose Beth? We may have lost Beth, yeah. this is Jessica. Beth, are you My, here? Yeah, it came back. Okay. <laughs> Lynn, 
go ahead and um, speak. You have two minutes. Mm, it's not working again. Let's try Keith Rechtal to be followed by Valerie Stinger. Hello, uh, I'm a Parks and Rec Commissioner and I wanna highlight two shortcomings of the proposed commission size reduction. Uh, first, an important part of our function is community outreach. If the community has parks and rec suggestions or problems, they're much more likely to come to the commission if they personally know a commissioner. But parks and rec has such a wide variety of users, it's hard for the currently for seven commissioners to cover the whole community and it'd be even harder for five commissioners. So reducing the community, reducing the commission size would hurt our interaction with the public. A second issue involves ad hoc committees. And as you know, there's just not enough time for these media issues to be worked through inside commission meetings. So these issues have to be worked offline in ad hoc committees. But a five member commission must limit its ad hoc committee to just two people. And for complex issues, that third person in the ad hoc produces much better debate and much better investigation. So as a result, I strongly encourage you to retain this current seven person size of the Parks and Rec Commission. Thank you. Vice Mayor Du Bois, it seems that Beth may have dropped off, so I'll continue with the speakers. The next speaker is Valerie Stinger. Valerie, you have two minutes to address council. Valerie, go ahead. Thank you. Sorry. No, it's okay. I wanted to thank council members Cormac and Du Bois for the handbook. I think it has a lot of strengths in it. Uh, I'm speaking tonight as myself, uh, representing myself because the commissions did not have time to respond. Um, I find both specificity and flexibility in this document. Specificity, which gives needed guidance and flexibility, which allows for different situations faced by different uh, boards, commissions and committees in applying the various guidelines. I would, however, like to call out some directives in the handbook and ask that these details, and they are details, be given some attention in the uh, week that comes ahead of us. First is the setting of priorities. The handbook allows for priorities established by a commission and confirmed by the council. And that ensures that the commission's work is valued by the council. It should be recognized, however, that commissions uh, may have a more focused lens on the needs of their men uh, within their mandate. These priorities may be valuable to the commission, but uh, the council may not have enough information to assess them. And I would like to see exploratory, uh, an allowance for exploratory priorities uh, for the commission to do some work and bring it to the council for your further approval. I'd also like you to consider two timing issues with regard to the work plan. One is that uh, we can we are charged with having our commitments to you by February. That only works if the council has its priority meeting on the first Saturday of February. And the second is the issue of emerging mid-cycle work. We need to have a provision for unplanned work that has a very short deadline. Only a short turnaround time is available on occasion and the handbook needs to commit commissioners to bring forth only substantive proposals, but the council has to give a prompt review. I have some other details that I'd like to submit by letter, but I do wanna thank the uh, council for considering a handbook to um, formalize the council expectations of the boards, commissions and committees. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Our next speaker is Randy Pop. Randy, go ahead, you have two minutes. Thank you, as past chair of the ARB, I'll start by saying how much I enjoyed my time on the board and very much appreciated the appointment. It was rewarding to participate in our city process and since then have encouraged many to consider doing so as well. 
I'd like to clearly say that some of the changes you are considering tonight are quite positive and if adopted, will improve the quality of the work product and enhance the process. With a focus toward the ARB, I'm appreciative of the language directing that members should be well prepared having reviewed the material and familiarized themselves with the relevant municipal code language. I'm certain this will add efficiency and focus to the hearings. Good preparation and understanding of our zoning will help to remove vagary and misdirection. Here's my concern. Some of the proposed changes, if adopted, will drastically adjust my perspective regarding the value of serving on a board, and I'm doubtful I could still recommend professionals participate in the way I have previously. A council authority that grants the right to remove a member at any time for any reason is dictatorial and unmanageable. To be removed without cause could be permanently damaging to an individual's professional reputation. Media and other coverage of removal could have lasting negative impact, even if the reason is a political or professional disagreement. I served on the ARB at a time when a member was caught stealing and something like that, or conviction of unethical conduct was determined creates cause. A disagreement due to politics or opinion would not be the same. The 14th Amendment of our country defines the right of due process. I would argue that the changes proposed violates that right in a clear and obvious manner. Personally, if this language is adopted, I may never again consider serving on a border commission in Palo Alto and will broadcast this caution to others as well. Next, any restriction of members expressing their opinion to the media seems to be to be in direct conflict with our freedom of speech rights. I'm no expert, but this type of communication does not seem to meet the low First Amendment value test. Instead, I recommend all members be instructed as part of their training to preface their comments as not speaking for the board or city. Allowing for more communication along with better and more far-reaching community engagement should be seen as a positive. Finally, I want to emphasize how important appropriate interaction between members and applicants can be. As an example, architects spend hundreds, if not thousands of hours developing proposals and a 10 to 20 minute presentation is never enough to articulate the nuance and quality. Meetings limited to one to two board members where they can listen, question and gain understanding can help them be better prepared to issue a decision. This type of interaction during the hearing process but outside the public realm can easily be done with appropriate training against delivery of opinion or observation and the necessary management of Brown Act rules. Thank you for taking the time to hear my comments. Thank you, Randy. Our next speaker is a phone caller with the last three digits on the phone of 000, to be followed by Rohan Ghosh and Rebecca Eisenberg. Hello. Yes, go ahead. You have Hello. two minutes. Yeah, thank you. This is uh, Martin Bernstein. I'm speaking solely as an individual and not representing any opinion of the HRB. Uh, I agree with adopting a handbook. Uh, the HRB is clear in its role as a forwarding recommendation body to the city council. Um, regarding the uh, training that was mentioned in the newspaper, um, the HRB is the certified local government agency for the city of Palo Alto. And uh, we are required to um, do the uh, 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 training that is required by the state of California. So that's already, that requirement's already met. Um, the, uh, one of the values of the HRB members was certainly is the comprehensive administrative history that uh, current board members have. Uh, without administrative history, we've seen that poor decisions on historic preservation uh, can occur. occur. Uh, the city council has a history of for sometimes only one applicant for, an, for a board member uh, vacancy ha happens. And in that light, I suggest that the city council consider including in its proposal that the city retain flexibility in modifying the term limits from time to time if no applicants uh, apply. And I'm uh, open to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Our next speaker is Rohan Ghosh to be followed by Rebecca Eisenberg and then Michael Alchek. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, you have two minutes. Hi, yeah, my name is Rohan. I'm a Pali student, uh, I'm Palo Alto resident and I would like to express my pretty firm disagreement with the changes being proposed, especially I think they run counter to the very ideas of local democracy. I think they're a threat to our to the rule of law and our like basic ability for citizens to participate in our city government. Uh, I think instructing uh, 
board and commission members not to speak to the press, even in their, even un, like under them, even uh, disclaiming that they are speaking as of themselves, uh, speaking for themselves, that, that change really hurts the ability of the public to follow what's going on in boards and commissions, which are already a pretty opaque space for people who aren't actively following them. Uh, I think further the ability of council to remove people for any reason, that is a pretty dictatorial measure, I, I would think, pretty contrary to city democracy. And uh, reducing the sizes of these commissions definitely reduces the amount of outreach they can do to the community, which is extremely problematic considering, again, they're already quite opaque and reducing that outreach even further would significantly hamper uh, the public's abilities to follow this, uh, follow boards and commissions. So I, I think these changes are quite alarming and I, I do not support them. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. Our next speaker is Rebecca Eisenberg to be followed by Michael Alchek and then Aram James. Rebecca, you may need to unmute from your end. Let's try going to Michael Alchuk. Are you now. back? Okay, go yes. ahead, Rebecca. Sorry, it wasn't giving me the notice. Okay, I'm Rebecca Eisenberg. As you know, hopefully you can hear me. I'm running for city council kind of for one of these reasons. So here we are at the main event of the evening after the opening acts performed below expectations. This is not off to a strong start city council, but I want to help. Your proposed guidelines for commissioners, should you silence the community or empower the community? Why is this complicated? As to eliminating commission opportunities, there are dozens of volunteers wanting to step up and volunteer their time and expertise. Why do you insist you know more than they do? Your prohibitions on speaking with the press. That would be perfect in an employment manual at Google. Hell, I've written those exact employment manuals for companies that have trade secrets. But this is not Google. This is a city government. It is not a private company. Unlike Google, you have the legal ob obligation to disclose your deliberations and no right to hide them. Finally, as you know, I worked really hard. I literally researched for months and made sure that I had 100% solid, valid legal grounds before urging you all to remove a commissioner from service due to his egregious conflict of interest, serving on the board of directors for an applicant at the same time he heard the applicant as a commissioner. This was truly valid grounds. And you all agreed with me. You didn't reappoint him. You did the right thing based on solid evidence. But now you want to assert right to remove a commissioner without this kind of research and this kind of compelling grounds? That's not right. That's unfair and anti-democratic and most likely illegal. Time after time, the city council points to laws as justifications for making decisions that harm the public. As an attorney with almost three decades of experience who knows the laws you cite far better than you do. Well, this makes it only more clear how irrational it is to have a legislative body that includes zero lawyers, much less experienced lawyers. And although you may point to Molly Stump for backup, for your legal conclusions, I've spoken with Molly and I strongly believe something has been lost in translation. Please, if you can't follow the law, listen to the community and follow common sense. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you, Rebecca. Our next speaker is Michael Alchek to be followed by Aram James. Michael, Good evening, go council. Minutes. Good evening, council members. My name is Mike Alchek, and I have had the honor of serving on the Planning Commission under the leadership of former chairs Eduardo Martinez, Mark Michael, Greg Tanaka, Adrian Fine, Ed Lowing. Billy Riggs, and current chair, Carrie Templeton. I have also had the honor of serving as the chair of the commission myself. 
I believe that formalizing standards across our local boards and commissions is a laudable effort. And I am speaking tonight to address one of several suggestions in the draft handbook that I believe needs your immediate attention. There are many valid reasons to remove an appointee from a commission or board, and there should be a clearly defined process to do so. However, the language in the draft allowing removal by a majority vote of the city council without cause, notice or hearing is very concerning. Planning commissioners are appointed by the city council instead of elected by residents so that their recommendations can be made independent of their popularity. This independence is crucial to the quality and integrity of our work product. Over the past decade, our political bodies have become subject to greater polarization and partisanship, and we must not ignore the real threat that commissioners could be removed solely in an effort to stifle diverse perspectives in our community. It would be naive to assume that this sort of political targeting only happens at the state and national level. A process that required cause for removal, adequate notice and a public hearing would be indisputably fair and unquestionably apolitical. Without each of these elements, what will protect this new very powerful removal tool from corruption? A simple majority vote certainly will not. Even requiring a unanimous vote would only minimize the potential for corruption, but does not eliminate it. Please reconsider this removal language and adopt requirements that increase the transparency and fairness of the removal process and protect the independence and integrity of Palo Alto's boards and commissions. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Our next speaker is Aram James to be followed by Jeff Greenfield. Aram, go ahead, you have two minutes. You know, we're gonna add another lawsuit uh, for, for the city here. Uh, you're inviting a lawsuit. I suspect that your best choice is to get some free uh, advice on the violations of the First Amendment and 14th Amendment, et cetera, et cetera, but from the ACLU, see what they say about this. Um, and why are you trying to do a, a, a Trump Barrett kind of hearing to rush this thing through uh, before the new members of the city council are elected? I suggest you put this over until the new board members, city council members are elected. Um, so let, let, let's go on from here. I'm going to read briefly to you from New York Times versus Sullivan. Uh, Thus, we consider this case against the background of a profound national commitment to the principle that debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, wide open, and it may well include vehement, caustic, and sometimes unpleasantly sharp attacks on government and public officials. I'm going to then skip to the next page of this book, where it says, quoting the same phrase that Wessler had used. He was a, one of the attorneys that uh, tried uh, uh, New, New York Times versus Sullivan representing the New York Times said that using a subsequent contemporary case, he said, if judges are to be treated as men, and I would add, of, and women of fortitude, able to thrive in a hearty climate, surely the same must be true of other government officials such as elected city commissioners. Grow up, folks. You're going to get criticized. And for you to suggest that members of the public cannot criticize individual members of a council or the HRC is violative of the First Amendment on its face. Come on, folks. You can do a whole lot better. I appreciate the effort that's gone into the handbook, but it's violative of the First Amendment. The, due, the lack of due process is an attempt to you know, in the firing of members with no uh, cause is also a chilling effect on our First Amendment. You need to run this through and pass somebody other than Molly Stump, who makes special rules of her own, uh, of, has her own standards for the First Amendment, amendment that don't, don't comport with the, the Constitution of the United States or the California equivalent of the First Amendment. I appreciate that, but Lord have mercy, you better think long and hard. We do not need another expensive lawsuit against the city and Tom and 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 uh, Commissioner Cormack or City Council Member Cormack, you've done just that. Come on now, grow up. Thank you, Aram. Our next speaker is Jeff Greenfield to be followed by Mark Weiss. Jeff, go ahead, you have two minutes. Good evening again, Mr. Vice Mayor and Council Members. I chair the Parks and Rec Commission and I'm speaking on my own behalf. I appreciate the effort from the Council ad hoc and staff on the BCC handbook and guidelines. I'm generally in favor of your proposal and a number 
of specific comments will follow. First, I'd like to urge you to keep the PRC at seven members. I think you'll agree this is an effective commission. Our scope is quite broad as reflected in the name of our guiding document, the Parks, Trails, Natural Open Space and Recreation Master Plan. As an aside, please change page 12 of the handbook to use this full master plan name. But I, I know that staff appreciates and values working with the PRC and benefits from our relationship. As Keith noted, a smaller commission size makes collaborative ad hoc work and general brainstorming outside of meetings much more difficult. You understand how Brown Act constraints limit a body of seven, a body of five is hindered considerably more. Also the increased individual workload could make recruiting even more difficult. Now onto the proposal guidelines, lots of questions and comments. Would BBCs be permitted to agendize an item at staff's request if it is not part of an approved work plan or city council directive? Um, also more process details on how to promptly update work plans given packed council agendas would be appreciated. Others have touched on media communications. We need to be responsible, measured and permitted to speak. On timelines, I suggest appointment of all BCCs during Q4 of odd number non-election calendar years. This optimizes alignment of annual BCC startup cycles, including work plans at the beginning of the year and eliminates lame duck appointments. We need a plan for removal of, of a BCC member. We serve at your pleasure. Guidelines are needed and it should include, it has to occur in an open public meeting. Term limits, uh, lots of questions on a transition plan, migrating to four year terms, uh, would this apply, apply retroactively, et cetera. Perhaps consider a nominal BCC meeting attendance guideline for council liaisons. I'm open to one or two year non-voting uh, youth terms on the Parks and Rec Commission. Consider recommending uh, annual retreats to establish priorities and a work plan. Consider adding guidelines on for online BBC meetings. Uh, thank you for your consideration. The standardizing the BBC is a benefit our community. Happy to elaborate uh, on anything. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Our next speaker is Mark Weiss to be followed by our final speaker, Kat Snyder. Mark, you may need to unmute from your end. There you go. I agree with 11 of the previous 13 speakers. Um, I just want to add that in 2008, Palo Alto City Council declared citizen engagement as a priority for its term if we adopt this handbook with the objections that this group has raised we are declaring that the pendulum has reversed and we don't want people like us to be engaged. I yield my time. Thank you, Mark. And our final speaker is Kat Snyder. Kat, go ahead, you have two minutes. Hi. Um so I get that you want to have a consistent message across uh, the city and, and all of the agencies, but I'm concerned that the, the cure may be worse than the disease in this case, namely the gag order, uh, you know, not being able to speak to the media. I think that, you know, the media newspapers, they have a duty to report on whether city agencies are functioning properly. Um, and so, a policy forbidding all unapproved communications with the press would make it so that they can't do their job. Um, it's very important for them to be able to have access uh, to, you know, subject matter experts about the city government and about whatever board that they're on. That's what the board members and commissioner are. Um, you know, subject matter experts. And it's important to be able to have an unscripted conversation with them. Um, I think that, I think that what Aaron James says is correct that you open yourself to a lawsuit if you do this, um, particularly when it comes to letting people go without cause that does have a chilling effect on free speech. And the lawsuit doesn't even have to come 
from any of the board members. It can come from newspapers when it comes to First Amendment rights. Um, there's plenty of case law that shows that that's true and that it's generally effective. So I would definitely recommend getting rid of the gag order section. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. And that's the end of our speakers, Vice Mayor Du Bois. Okay, thank you. And thank you to all the speakers. Um, and given the hour, we're gonna continue this item to our next meeting. I uh, appreciate you all staying on and giving us your thoughts. So we're gonna to move to uh, the last item tonight, which is council member questions, comments, and announcements. Does anybody have anything? Um, I have two quick things. So we did have the League of Cities uh, was online and I voted as directed, which was to abstain. <laughs> but, um, they only had 237 when they needed 239 for a quorum. So the vote was advisory to the League of Cities uh, committee. It did pass at a pretty wide margin. And a lot of it had to do with looting and issues on social media that were uh, very, uh, very much like what happened in, in the summer when we had our curfew. And that's what had, had uh, spurred this motion at the League of Cities. And then the second thing I just wanted to announce was I had the pleasure of opening the uh, UN Association Film Festival last Friday. It's been in Palo Alto for 23 years now. It's going on until October 25th and it's all online, all documentaries. So I'd urge you guys to check that out. Um, anybody else? Great. Okay, well, thank you. Then, uh, meeting. do you have any idea how to um, access them online? Uh, the film festival, yeah, yeah, it's a UN, <laughs> UN, but just film festival, nothing else. UNAFF 2020 is the name of the film festival, and you can find it. Okay, good, thanks. Great, okay, and with that, uh, meeting adjourned. So, thank you guys.